Uh, before we call the meeting to order tonight, there's been a quite a bit of last minute correspondence given to the commission. If folks that are arriving have had a chance to look at it, I'm going to allow a couple minutes for that to happen before we call this to order. If you wouldn't mind just giving me a signal if you're ready. And Are we without a chair tonight? Yes, Greg is not going to be here this evening. Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's uh, session of the Planning Commission's regular meeting for April 18th, 2019. Could we have a roll call, please? Mr. Schifrin? Here. Conway? Here. Spelling? Spellman? Here. <laughs> Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? Here. Singleton? Here. Pepping? So Greg is out this evening with notice. He's not feeling well, unfortunately. Uh, do we have any statements of disqualification this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to oral communications. This is a time for anyone in the public who would like to speak on items that are not on our agenda this evening. Is there anyone that would like to speak to anything not on tonight's agenda? Yeah, if you would like to speak, would you please queue up and we'll allow two minutes each for each speaker. Thank you. Um, it is on the agenda, but I, since the chair is not here, I, I'd asked a request for extra time, so I don't know what's happening. Yes, we're aware of that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else like to speak tonight on items not on our agenda? Okay, moving on. Let's go to approval of minutes. We have the approval for minutes for both March 14th and March 21st. Let's take the March 14th minutes first. We have a motion for the approval. Move the minutes, March 14th. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'll abstain. I'll abstain. One ab I was going to abstain also. I was Two not. abstentions. Robert and Christian for the 14th. Moving to the March 21st minutes. We have a motion. Move the minutes. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
and no abstentions on March 21st. So we'll move to our public hearing portion of the meeting. The first item up on our agenda is the rail trail, phase two of segment seven. Do we have a staff report? Yeah, good evening, commissioners. <clears throat> uh, Mike Ferry with planning. So tonight we're gonna uh, mix it up a little bit. I'm going to uh, start off and then I'm gonna pass it over to Chris Schneider. He's the assistant public works director. He's gonna talk about some of the detailed portions of the plan. Uh, we've got Leo Mena from ICF uh, consulting firm that did the environmental work. Um, and after he speaks, we're gonna bring it back to me and uh, I'll close it. We also have um, a representative from the um, Police department, and do we have a fire guy? And we're hoping for a um, somebody from the fire department, and they just want to give a comment at the end of the presentation. Um, Chris also would like to show a video, and that will be after the presentation as well. And then we do have Leslie Keedy, if in case there's any questions on uh, trees, tree protection or tree removal. So I'm going to uh, talk about the exciting policies and history of the rail trail, and then I get to pass it off and Chris does the fun stuff. So the, the rail trail is a 32 mile trail. It extends from Davenport to Watsonville, and it goes on uh, as a primary alignment of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Trail, and that's about 50 miles long. Regional Transportation Commission, the RTC, prepared a scenic trail network master plan to establish a continuous alignment, design standards, and guidelines for the Coastal Rail Trail. Is this really loud? This sounds loud to me. Okay. Um, so the RTC uh, adopted a trail master plan after multiple years of public input. Um, the design of that plan was to install a trail in a way that would not have the uh, rails removed. Uh, the RTC did a um, environmental impact report that was approved in 2013 and an addendum to that report that was certified in 2014. And they recently completed the unified corridor study, which um, um, they ended up um, protecting the rail right of way for high capacity transit service freight service and a bike and pedestrian trail. So there's a lot of history to hold on to the rails in this right of way. Um, and I'm gonna show you a slide with a lot of general plan policies that also reflect that. So segment seven is 3. miles, 3.1 miles long. It goes from Moore Creek to the roundabout. Um, as many of you commissioners remember, we approved phase one of that that went from Moore Creek to um, Street, California Street in 2017. So this is phase two. Um, as part of the phase two analysis, the early analysis showed the right of way would be on the near east side of the track, the north side of the track. After they looked at that, the amount of tree removal, the potential for, uh, the potential for erosion, um, and the fact that they would have to build really stout retaining walls to support not just the trail, but the rail, the freight train that actually uses the rail, they decided to move it to the south side. Um, the city also looked at going through La Barranca Park and going through La Barranca Park, about halfway through the park as you're heading towards the coast, you would have to go basically off of that cliff and then 35 feet down, which would end up being an enormous structure. It's probably a visual impact that would certainly be expensive. Um, on top of that, the original design of that linear park didn't have any kind of facilities for bike paths. It's used by uh, folks for strolling. There's an elderly facility nearby, and a lot of those folks use that for just strolling along the uh, California. And it was actually brought to the Parks and Recreation Commission where they did not support that alignment. The city also looked for on-street alignments. Um, they looked at California going down to West Cliff, and they also looked, I'm sorry, uh, it would be, yeah, California going down to West Cliff. Bay. Bay, I'm sorry. Bay Street going down to West Cliff. 
and then California to Laurel to Pacific Avenue. And both of those don't meet ADA requirements. They both have high uh, pedestrian and bicycle uh, accident rates. Uh, it wouldn't encourage non-bicyclists to start bicycling. Uh, so that alternative was uh, not looked at further. And then on the south side of the track, uh, based on input from our emergency services, the Ecology Action and the Bike Santa Cruz County folks, they wanted to look at a 16-foot wide path. And that would have uh, literally chewed into La Barranca Park, requiring a lot of tree removal. Um, it would impact the park. And so um, the trail was uh, brought down to 12 feet. So the proposed project we're looking at tonight is a 12-foot trail. It's about 10 feet from the center line of the rail, almost all the way through on both the uh, north and south sides. There's a little bit of variation, and I think Chris will show you a slide for that. Okay, so we'll look at the pictures. So that's a, a pretty typical rail trail kind of setup right there. Um, so. I won't even go over these. These are all the general plan policies that we have now that encourage us, us to look as development occurs to try to get things like a depot site or maybe a parking area or uh, a bike area for future transit service. So as development occurs now, we're, we're looking at that. Uh, there's a bunch of other general plan policies that talk about uh, transit stops in, in anticipate anticipate anticipation of a local rail service and et cetera, et cetera. I won't read them all. So a little bit of the background on this whole project. In the 90s, Sam Farr champions a task force to foster appreciation and success for the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail that goes all around the bay. All around the, bay. Um, the RTC purchased the line in 2012 32 miles long, it was $14.2 million using state grant funds. The master plan was adopted by the RTC in 2013, and in 2015, the city hired RRM Design Group to complete the design and the environmental rail of Section 7, Segment 7. RRM is the same group that we used when we uh, designed the Arana Gulch project, so we had a lot of success with the design and uh, the way it functions today. So in 2016, the Transportation and Public Works Commission approved the final schematic plan for this phase of Segment 7. And we separated it into two different phases, primarily for timing. So the, the first phase that we approved is probably going to be completed, is it really at the end of 2018? Phase 1? 2019. Maybe 2020. So. We're very close to starting construction on that. Okay. Um, yeah, 2020. So this is the entire segment seven. It's a combination of the blue line and the red line. The uh, red line is what we're talking about tonight. That was the previous approved segment, the blue one. Uh, another pretty typical shot of a rail trail. This one's down in San Clemente. And the train goes by there really frequently, and uh, it's, it's, it's cool, the past passenger train. This is a simulation of what it'll look like around uh, Depot Park. Except there's no trail. This is a simulation of what it would look like adjacent to the uh, sewage treatment plant right here. You can see the retaining wall. That's the style of... Um, of uh, fencing that we're thinking about. And then kind of folded into all of this, and I hope that you guys got the copies. I think I gave you pages 32 through 34, the Arts Master Plan. It's a really robust plan, and they specifically um, have those three or four pages dedicated to just this phase of Segment 7. They have a variety of, of ideas, wall tiles, uh, kid-like scale, uh, pieces of art along the wall, a whole variety of stuff. And that'll go through another public process before they choose uh, any kind of art treatment. That's a rendition of what uh, it might look like. 
and this is by uh, RRM, not by our arts department. And this was uh, part of the arts master plan, just some exhibits on some of the um, art that could be placed there. I think a lot of people uh, like some of that stuff, some folks don't, so it'll be a public process. And this is another location, not just the retaining walls, but uh, even the trestle and, or murals. So one of the reasons um, we would really like to get the public onto this stretch of right-of-way is because there's a lot of social issues. Right now, um, I would find it hard to believe if a regular family, unless there is a big family, would use that as a shortcut. It's like an obvious shortcut to the beach. Uh, we had the same kind of thing happen in Arana Gulch that when the trail went in and there was eyes on the trail, uh, a lot of this problem, it wasn't as comfortable to camp there. Uh, this was taken about 9 o'clock this morning, so it's not even nighttime. I, I, I don't, can't imagine what it looks like at nighttime, but there's trails that go down into the um, Neary Lagoon area. There's, um, it was fenced, and there's holes cut in the fences, and then really established trails and camps down in the uh, Neary Lagoon area. And um, that might be one of the things that the police department will be able to highlight. This, this was another shot of uh, a camp, and this is actually up from the trail. This is La Barranca Park behind, so it's on a, a really steep uh, slope. So a lot of debris, a lot of camping debris down on the bottom there. So the trail will be open from dawn to dusk, and that's based on the EIR and the um, city policy with parks. Uh, the city is going to be responsible for maintenance of the trail. There's going to be six heritage trees removed. Um, that'll require 32 replacement trees to be planted, and the location and species of those will be under the uh, guidance of our uh, city arborist. Um, the project includes tree protection measures for 13 trees. 11 of those are recognized as heritage trees in the municipal code. And sheet two has all the details on the protection. And I sent you guys this copy. It's color coded and it tells you which ones are heritage to be removed and to be uh, maintained and protected. Uh, Public Works walked the alignment after the first initial study was advertised. We were going to remove uh, six trees uh, right around the trestle area. So there was some concern about that. Uh, members of the local chapter of the Sierra Club um, and I think um, some other members of the public went on a walk and looked at that. At the, based on the response uh, from that meeting, Public Works redesigned the trail in that location and it is going to save five of those six trees. The sixth tree uh, might be able to be saved when, it, when they're under construction, the city arborist will go out, be there, they'll have a root exam, and if root pruning can save the tree, they'll save the sixth tree. There's also a condition of approval specifically for that in the conditions. So now the exciting part is the policies. So the guiding principle of the general plan I'm gonna read in the 2030 general plan, one of the guiding principles is to provide an accessible, comprehensive, effective transportation system that integrates automobile use with sustainable and innovative transportation options, including enhanced public transit, bicycle, and pedestrian networks throughout the community. So that's like a prism that um, was used to generate all of the other policies in the general plan relating to that. And in your staff report, and I won't read them, there's 57 general plan goals, policies, and actions that support the development of the trail. There's five local coastal plan uh, policies that support the development of the trail. And even though this is outside of the Neary Lagoon management plan, three of the objectives of that plan and uh, one policy of the plan support the project as it's proposed. So I'm gonna pass it off to Chris and He's going to discuss the actual trail. Good evening. Um, I also want to just give a couple of uh, just a little clarification on what Mike had noted on the, you know, different alternatives we looked at. You know, one of the very beginning was 
shifting the trail to the south side versus the north side. The north side is much closer to Neary Lagoon and adjacent to Neary Lagoon. It would have had a huge impact on the vegetation and the construction of a retaining walls, et cetera, in that area. And that was one important reason we moved it to the other side of the track. The other issue is that required two crossings of the tracks. And the whole point, or one of the purposes of this, the design of segment seven is keep it all on the south side. So we're not cra crossing the railroad tracks. People have difficulty crossing railroad tracks on bikes, and also they're really difficult to permit. So you have to go through, through CPUC, et cetera. They're expensive, they take a lot of time. Um, the details of the project. So from California and Bay to uh, the first part we'll call segment F, which is along the wastewater city's regional wastewater treatment plant. Starting at Bay in California is where segment or segment seven phase one ends or starts, however you want to look at it. We're relocating the stops at Bay, um, the other California street to this intersection in order to stop traffic so that when you make the crossing on your bike, it's going to, or as a pedestrian, you're going to be safer. It crosses initially through a little bit of the park and then down into um, next to the rail. This is what it looks like now to the left. You have Neary Lagoon Park and the parking area and the entrance to the wastewater treatment plant. And on the right, you see the fence that's uh, La Barranca Park. This is what it, the plan view of, of what it's gonna look like afterwards. And you can see that it touches the edge of the park and comes off the um, stop controlled intersection. The vehicles only authorized um, uh, access point is because the fire trucks can't make that turn that the bikes and pedestrians use. So we're providing that secondary access so that emergency vehicles can access the trail when they need to. You can see some of the street lights um, up here, you know, that are along the trail. You can see the fence. The edge, Mike had noted, the edge of the trail has to be 10 feet from the center line of the railroad track. That's the minimum requirement. In some areas, you can get to eight and a half, but it has to be a very short section. It can't be on a curve. There's a variety of things that uh, regulate that. And then the path itself is 12 feet wide. Here's a section um, of the beginning of the retaining wall. So as you can see down at the bottom, there's the 10 foot to the center line, which is the area that has to be clear of any vertical obstructions. The 12 foot path, which includes two foot clear on each side. Um, and essentially this is so bicyclists don't hit their handlebars on vertical obstructions as well. So minimum eight foot travel way with two foot shoulders. And then the uh, retaining wall here, which is a timber lagging wall. A timber lagging wall is, um, you know, reminiscent and more uh, the aesthetic of a railroad. It's also um, easier to construct, has fewer impacts related to what's behind it. You need least less width to build a timber lagging wall than say a concrete retaining wall and other, other methods. This is a typical example of the timber lagging wall. We have uh, some at Arana Gulch and a variety of other places in town. The other uh, benefit of this type of wall is it's harder to graffiti. It doesn't have the smooth surface. It's usually darker wood, absorbs paint if it happens, those kinds of things. The, um, the, uh, Second section is uh, we're calling segment G in the environmental document is where you get further into the, the deeper part of the trough next to the, the tracks, the part, portion that had been excavated uh, for the railroad track. One thing I, I wanna tell you in the video I'm gonna show you is about this is really an active rail line. Roaring Camp uses this line on a regular basis. They have track rights that go past into the previous segment um, at about Liberty Street. So another three or 400 feet up from where we have F here. And the video will show that in, in uh, greater detail. We're getting into the deep, as I said, the deeper section. Um, again, this essentially the same design of lighting, 
uh, that is at the minimum wa wattage and power required. Um, ha we'll have security cameras. The uh, lights are uh, dark, dark sky compliant and are directed down and shielded. The railing that's required between the railroad and the path is four and a half feet high and it's cable railing. Uh, so it just prevents people from going over into the track area. Now it's open at each end, but on the path line, it is the requ a required fence. The, um, as you can see that the retaining wall is taller in here and the, the retaining wall varies from three and a half to 19 and a half feet tall. The slope that's, you can see this line right here, which is just a, which is the current slope at this section. And this is the area that we excavate into to build the wall and the path. And it varies as you go along the alignment. But that gives you an idea of because of this 10 foot clearance and the width of the path, this is where the wall has to be. We can't move it any closer towards the track. When we first looked at one of the options, which was widening the path another 14, you could see it'd be way over here and that there would be additional impacts associated, more trees removed, the wall would get higher. When we, this area is being worked up at the top, we are going to have to revegetate this area. And so there's an opportunity for potentially more trees on the slope for when we do our replanting. In addition, um, on segment, uh, on uh, phase one, we are replanting some of the trees, uh, the mitigation measure of replanting trees from this project in that area. So there will be about 12 trees um, required for mitigation here that are going to be planted in phase one. We also are looking at other locations here, but the right of way is really constrained. So uh, maybe there will be, a, well, as we get into construction, we'll see we can do them here. Otherwise, we'll have to provide a different location. Um, this uh, path comes with a drainage system, um, which you can see here, which uh, from time to time there's catch basins that will be captured into it. Currently, there's no drainage system out there. There's a few old ones that take the water from that side and, and uh, direct the water towards Neary Lagoon. What we're going to do is capture the water. We'll have um, inserts in the uh, catch basins to pick up sediment and trash. Um, the water that goes into the system uh, goes into the pipe down by the Neary Lagoon pump station. That pump station is closed off, which goes, exits to Cal Beach, is closed off during the dry weather season. Anything that goes into that system actually sits there, it backs up, and it goes into a sewer bypass pi pipe and is treated at the wastewater treatment plant. So there's usually no, during the dry weather season, there's nothing that goes out to Cal Beach. Before that pipe is open for the winter, um, to help to control flooding of potentially of the Neary Lagoon area and all the housing around it. Um, the lines are cleaned. All the water that's cleaned and using the lines is put, is captured with the Vactor truck and put into the treatment plant. So it's, it's all thoroughly cleaned before it's opened and allowed to go out to Cal Beach during the wet weather season, which is typically October 15th to April 15th. Obviously that can change with depending on the season that we're having. Um, this is uh, a segment um, which I'll show you on the aerial um, where there is a flatter spot where there's no retaining wall required. And in this area, there is a section that we're going to rock that is going to be for emergency vehicles and for um, maintenance vehicles to be able to pull off the trail while they're doing whatever they have to do out there in order to let bikes and pedestrians pass. So it's a small area. There's also a wider um, rail right away in this segment so that it's possible also that we could plant trees here. And um, that was just outside uh, this view. In this segment H, which is pretty much from the Y where the uh, train makes its turns to um, the wharf intersection, which is an old diagram not showing the roundabout. When we designed the roundabout, we knew that this project was coming and this crossing at the roundabout was designed with this project in mind. Um, as you can see, we are getting flatter in this area. 
there is some retaining wall and the reason that we're building a retaining wall and this is in the area of the eucalyptus grove is because we have a large storm drain pipe there's actually two of them um, that drain near lagoon from the pump station one's a gravity line one's a force main and we can't build a retaining wall on top of that pipe it has it can't have the load and we have to be able to dig this up hopefully not but in the future somewhere down the road if something happens so this retaining wall was designed to accommodate the pipe and it's now been redesigned to accommodate and save five of the six eucalyptus trees that we are intending to remove. The sixth is still under question and that'll happen during construction. We'll have to excavate around the tree to see where the roots are and whether they impact uh, the construction of the path or not. This is at the parking lot. Um, <clears throat> for uh, Cal's Beach, or the other side, excuse me, across from the Sanctuary Scenic Center. Um, there's currently four parallel parking spaces. We're gonna shift them towards the perpendicular spaces by a couple of feet. So we're not losing any parking, we're just making uh, a change, a slight change in their location and there's room to do that. In this area, we're getting eight and a half, eight and a half feet to the center line of the track. It is, um, a very a short section and it's also very straight and very open so it's easier to, um, to it's possible to do that there um, a couple of things you know I wanted to add um, the project includes also wayfinding uh, safety signage and directional signage uh, for the users um, as I said, the parking's not affected. Um, the slope of the path meets ADA. I know one of the ideas that's been brought up is let's put this back out on the street system. But the street system, the way it's configured, Beach Street and Laurel Street Hill are not ADA. And they're difficult for a lot of people to get up and down and traverse. So uh, this is gonna be a separate path that meets a lot of the goals that we're, that we're all trying to strive for, which is to encourage bike riding and to you know improve on the environment in the long run i can give that back to mike or to leo okay leo hey good evening everyone can you hear me okay yeah great um so i will provide you with an overview of our CEQA document which is an initial study mitigated negative deprivation um, i'll be referring to it as an ismnd so um we prepared our initial study and published it on July 13, 2018, um, at which time it was out for public review for a total of 30 days. Um, and in that document, we identified um, potentially significant impacts that were then mitigated to a less than significant level with mitigation for um, aesthetics, air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, geology and soils, um, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology um, and water quality, noise and transportation. So one of the key issues that we have identified for this project is impacts on biological resources as it will require the removal of trees on the south side of Neary Lagoon, um, as well as um, the removal of vegetation. So what we did in that document in our initial study is we identified pre-construction surveys and pre-construction mitigation for impacts to special status species um, during construction. So that includes mitigation for uh, California red-legged frog, western pond turtle, special status birds, special status bats, um, the San Francisco dusky-footed wood rat, and uh, monarch butterflies, all spe species which we have identified as being potentially in the area. Um, we also include mitigation in this document um, for the potential impact on that riparian scrub located on the south side of the track. Um, we identify a mitigation at a three to one ratio of all of the uh, willow trees that are gonna be removed on the site. Um, and that mitigation has been identified to be at an offsite uh, location around Antonelli Pond. So um, I also wanted to add um, that we've identified that the loss of this um, disturbed riparian area located on the south side of the track uh, represents about 2.5% of the um, 
of the entire habitat in the area, inclu including you know, Neary Lagoon in the area. So all of that, coupled with the fact that we included uh, mitigation measures for offsite, um, led us to the conclusion that this is indeed a less than significant impact on the riparian areas. Um, and then just further background on how we got to this. Um, we also had to do NEPA for this project, and so we did work with Caltrans um, and their biologists, and we coordinated with them and prepared a natural environmental study. Um, and so in that document, um, we did a lot of the work that we also have in this initial study where we um, worked with the Caltrans biologists who in turn consulted with the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and so all of, the, all of that communication is in this um, has resulted in this in this uh, analysis that we have in this initial study. Um, so once once that document was published on July 13th, and now for review for 30 days, we did receive comments from the Coastal Commission, uh, the Monterey Bay Air Resource District, and the Sierra Club, and we provide a response to their letters. Um, in addition, we also had uh, comments from individuals, 96 of which were in support, and 10 of which were in opposition due to the biological impacts, the loss of trees. Um, we reviewed those letters, provided a response, um, and based on that review, it was concluded that um, the document should be recirculated in order to identify potential impacts to monarch butterfly, which wasn't assessed um, in the initial study um, originally. So um, we prepared that recirculated um, ISMND, and in that document, we uh, included um, some clarifications. Uh, we clarified as um, both Mike and Chris discussed the uh, change to instead of remove six uh, eucalyptus trees to to remove just um, one of them. So um, we added that as well as um, we did an analysis that quantified the potential air quality impacts and we included that in there. Um, and then finally, we also did include an assessment of the potential impacts to monarch butterfly. And I'll just give an overview of what we, what we, what we described in the document. Um, in the document, we did um, identify a potential impact um, during construction. And so we included mitigation for pre-construction surveys. Um, in terms of the loss, permanent loss of habitat from the removal of one eucalyptus tree, we had our biologists go to the site and assess the quality of that habitat based on the canopy size, the um, the um, the nectar sources in the area, um, and then we also um, reached out to, uh, to the Circe Society, which um, does a lot of work on monarch butterflies, um, about this specific site, um, and they identified they did not identify it. they identified it as not a uh, significant overwintering site, um, and we also had another personal communication with a biologist who worked in that area and prepared two documents in 2001 that documented that it's not a substantial, significant um, overwintering site, primarily because there aren't the nectar sources in the area. Um, so that information, coupled with the fact that we were, we were, we were going to remove potentially one tree, one eucalyptus tree, um, which accounts for 5% uh, of the total grove size. Um, we uh, determined that that impact would in fact be less than significant. So once that document, once we prepared that recirculated ISMND, we did uh, publish it on January 7th, 2019, and that was out for review for another 30 days. We received another um, round of comments, including from the Monterey Bay Air Resources District and the Sierra Club, and um, more individuals, 36 of which were in support and three of which were in opposition. Um, so we provided, um, a response uh, to the Sierra Club, their um, comments were predominantly around aesthetics, biological resources, including the monarch butterfly assessment that we had in the recirculated ISM and team, um, impacts on the riparian habitat, hydrological resources, climate change, and alternatives. We provided a response to all their comments, and we did not identify that any of those questions or comments resulted in any impacts that, um, that would be a significant effect. Uh, we documented that in our correspondence. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. I, I just wanted to find uh, one point of clarification. In the letter from Jillian Grinside, she sends a picture of a eucalyptus tree that she thought was being removed. That tree is not being removed, was never being removed in the first, even in the original one. So I just wanted to clarify that point. <laughs> So, 
After I summarize this, uh, we still would like the um, police and fire representatives to come up and make their comment. So the summary is segment seven, phase two, will be the third section of the scenic sanctuary trail network to be permitted in the city. This project will eliminate one of the missing gaps in that system. The project will reduce transportation-related energy use, greenhouse gas generation, and it will provide an equitable and sustainable alternative to coastal access for pedestrians, bicyclists, and the disabled. So we're recommending that the Planning Commission adopt the mitigated negative declaration and mitigated mitigation monitoring and reporting program, uh, which is Exhibit B in your um, staff report, and approve the coastal design slope mod variance and heritage tree removal permits based on the findings listed in the staff report and the conditions of approval. Since the Planning Commission advertisement went out, we got 83 additional comments in favor of the project, and we got eight comments uh, with concerns or against the project. And I think you've probably been forwarded those in batches from tests. So that concludes the presentation. I think uh, our fire and uh, police guys would like to make a comment. I'm Dan Ford with Sergeant Santa Cruz Police. And uh, we're just saying that the, the pass would allow more patrol opportunities in this area. Uh, we're constantly responding out there for, for campsites. Uh, over the summer, we were responding out there for arsons that were going up the hillside. It's a uh, hard area to patrol without a path. There's not a lot of um, vehicle accessibility, as well as uh, being able to get bicycles or ATVs into this area. And we generally do have um, campsites have been set up for long term where other places in the city were able to uh, go there and, and provide other opportunities for, for these long term campers. Uh, we've seen a lot of success with these kind of paths in the uh, Rainy Gulch area as well, being able to get people down there and respond to uh, the problems in the area. Good evening, uh, Jason Hyduk, Fire Chief for the Santa Cruz City Fire Department. And the Fire Department doesn't really have a say in what is going to be put in place, but we do uh, want to have input into how it's going to be put in place. And for us, um, we're really looking at access. Um, if we're going to have a number of people that are going to be traveling through an area, we want to be able to have access for medical calls. We want to have access for uh, fire calls. Right now, that area is problematic for us. Uh, we cannot get engines into it, and obviously, it's not having the same amount of use that we'll have when uh, the trail goes in. Uh, we expect that we can predict that we will have uh, people fall off a bike, they will trip, they will have a medical event, and we would like to be able to not have to walk them out. Uh, it's a fairly long section between California and the roundabout, um, and currently, right now, we're really limited um, to uh, basically the base of the trestle uh, behind Depot Park, and uh, we don't have any vehicle access right now from California down the railroad tracks. Um, we have had a number of incidents, uh, specifically this previous year, um, where we were having to come in from up top off of Bay Street or behind 170 West Cliff uh, or from near, near a Lagoon, um, and having the ability to drive a vehicle to either uh, where a fire is or drive a vehicle to where a patient is uh, cuts down on time, um, and most of our problems are time dependent. So uh, we support uh, putting in a surface that we can drive on, and we also support uh, putting in lights, uh, especially for evening activities. Um, and we can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay. Um, I also asked someone from Roaring Camp to be available, and I'm not sure if they've, they're here, but. Um, an opportunity to speak. And we have a video of how Roaring Camp uses the Y and currently is active. So with that, I'm gonna just play a little bit of it. And then, um, if you, why don't you speak first and then I'll show them the video. So I'm Christine, I'm an operations manager at Roaring Camp and I was asked to come down here and just read a comment from Milani. We at Roaring Camp would like the Commission to adopt the Rail Trail Phase 2, a seg uh, Segment 7, 
which includes the coastal permit, design permit, slope modification, variance, and heritage tree removal. We feel that it would benefit the community greatly by creating a safe path to travel. Thank you. Thanks. The, um, this, is, this was flown by a drone last year, um, a drone operator. Um, and um, shows how the Y is used and functions and why it's there. No pun intended. Um, it's a little bit slow, but everybody loves trains. So <laughs> let's have... This is going by the depot building. Um, which used to be the former depot, which was reconstructed as part of the depot park project, and the intent was at some point it could become a station. Going by the soccer field. So you see the Y, in order to get to the boardwalk, they go up the Y, and they go up towards the wastewater treatment plant. The distance they travel is further than Neary Lagoon and into the treatment plant, mm -hmm. approximately where Liberty excuse me, where Liberty enters the, um, um, where in, enters Bay Street. You can see the mobile home park that's above. The area that's up here that's turquoise, this is affectionately known, this area is Railroad Bobs, and uh, there is a fence there and it's a flat area. That's the area where the turnoff is and where there's potential some area for replanting of trees. It, um, the railroad right away actually is pretty wide in that location. So as you can see, the, um, the train goes pretty far up. Liberty is up around this area in here. Just missed view of the treatment plant. It goes past the mobile home park near Lagoon on the right. And then as it comes back, I'll stop it just after this little piece. So obviously they have to do the switch gear and now they're heading towards the boardwalk and backing towards the boardwalk. And then as they exit, they use the other part of the Y to head back up to uh, Felton. Anyway, I think it's just important to note that this is an active rail. It's been active for a long time by a local business um, and um, will continue to operate with the trail next to it. All right, thank you for that presentation. Before we move to um, public comment, do commissioners have any questions of staff? I, I have a couple of questions um, for um, Mr. Schneider. Um, the, the tw so the, the roadway, I guess we'll call it roadway, I guess, is 12 feet wide. Um, but then there's uh, two feet on each side that are um, is it is it paved in those two feet, or the, well, there's a gutter on one side, right? But is it paved all the way to the to the edge, to the, right? So it's edge? a total of 12 feet of paving, paving or concrete for the drain. So then, what's the two foot um, that the, the two foot <laughs> the, clearance that's at the on the fence side? So the the um, minimum width for a trail, bike path, or multi use path is eight feet with two, two, two foot shoulders. 
Okay. And so uh, we're showing the overall width, but we're also showing the two shoulders of two feet. And that essentially is to, you know, so people aren't, you know, when they're riding their bike, they're not riding with their handlebars up against the fence. Okay. Um, okay, that makes sense. Uh, and then the, and then in this same image, the cable rail, uh, what is the spacing on that cable rail? Um, there, I think it's 16 inches clear to the from the bottom of the trail to the first railing. Okay. Um, and then after that, it's on the order to six to eight inches, I believe. Okay. And, and it's not for fall protection. Right. But does it allow um, wildlife to go through? Yes. Okay. And that's a design change we made on uh, phase one, so we're using the same rail um, okay. design here on phase that's two. Right. I remember that. Um, does it, okay, no, I, it, that's it. That, those are my questions. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay, so at this time we're going to open it up for public comment. There is one group that has requested some extra time this evening, so we're going to accommodate that. This process essentially, the, the city tonight is the applicant for this project, so they will be given some time at the end of public comment to make any additional comments based on uh, the public comment that goes before it, so everyone's aware of that. Can I see a show of hands of how many people would like to speak this evening? Okay, so if you would line up, please, along the, the window wall and sign in before you reach the podium. And please state your name as you, as you get a chance to speak. I'm going to allow for three minutes for each person. And the applicant who, or group that's asked for additional time I'm willing to entertain. Do you have a sense for how long, how much time you would like? Five minutes. Sure, that's that's fine. Okay, so let's let's begin. Thank you, Vice Chair Spellman and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Gillian Greenside, and I'm representing the Sierra Club this evening. I'd like to start by saying that the Sierra Club is in support of the rail trail in general. And uh, we also have a charge to look carefully at the environmental impacts of each segment of the rail trail. And I'd like just to give a bit of a, a context that uh, in the north uh, coast area of the rail trail, uh, even though the, um, the red-legged frog habitat will be gone, uh, we did not oppose that. Uh, we did ask for more mitigations for the loss of the red-legged frog habitat, but we did not oppose it. In segment uh, seven, phase one, even though we lose some heritage trees, we did not oppose it. And we're not opposing this uh, segment seven, phase two. However, we feel that the environmental review is sorely lacking and alternatives have not been considered. And that's why we would like you to not um, approve uh, tonight, but to uh, ask for a, uh, an environmental impact report of this segment, which we believe has been understated as a habitat area and the impacts on that habitat area. We believe that the alternatives have not been looked at carefully enough, which would give a win-win situation for all of us who would like to see the rail trail and also protect the environment. The first look at this pro, uh, section, and by the way, it's a little bit confusing from, I believe, with all due respect, the staff report, you wouldn't know that this is a significant habitat area. And it was a bit confusing to lump both segments in together. This is less than a mile, this segment, uh, for $10 million. And it is, um, so far, one of the more significant habitat areas. 
in the first look at the habitat area, the monarch butterfly site was not even acknowledged to exist. And it was only when the Sierra Club brought that to attention that that was then recirculated, the initial study and mitigated ne negative declaration, and that was studied. However, uh, even in the recirculated document, the amount of um, habitat was not studied. It was uh, abstract, it was vague, the bird species were not studied, it was all based on hypotheticals. And uh, we believe that this uh, project, as it is designed, will significantly impact that environment, that habitat, and that the mitigations that are proposed will not be meeting any standard, and that there are alternatives. The alternatives have not been looked at, and they need to be looked at carefully, because, for example, the uh, the idea that you couldn't do use Bay Street because of the danger at uh, Bay and Westcliff doesn't accommodate the idea that or the plan that that whole intersection is going to be changed and improved. So there are many things that will happen here that could make this a much better project, saving the habitat and providing a rail, tra a good trail that may not be alongside the rail, but would protect everyone's concerns. And since time is running out, I would just like to say that, uh, you know, the idea of making, that this would be a place where accessible for people in wheelchairs to go into this area, I assume you've all walked it, and I assume you've all seen what sort of an area it is. I think that would be really something to look into more carefully in terms of security, lighting, and, um, and the idea that that would make it a safe place is very questionable. But the end and last second is that we feel that this needs a much more careful look at in terms of environmental impact. We hope you will do that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos, um, but I'm concerned about all, all progress on all 32 miles of our county-owned uh, rail trail. You know, I, I'm proud of the work that this commission, this, uh, commission does and the contractors and the RTC and everyone else over the years to make sure that the very best product is, is had and that uh, environmental concerns are addressed. And I think they've been addressed really well. I don't believe that a, a diversion to Bay Street is acceptable. I think it's a non-starter. Um, I think it's, it's fair that there are people that are passionate about environmental concerns, but I've been back there. I, I go back there from time to time. Uh, the last time I went, a couple of trips in December, and I saw a fire had taken place on the hillside below the the mobile homes, and I think that the potential damage to species, plants, critters, everything back there may be worse if we do nothing. You know, as it sits, we can call that, oh, it's a habitat. Well, it'll be a habitat when we build, too, when we're done building, and it might well be a safer habitat. There's probably fires every night due to the campers that don't get out of control, but one day they might get well out of control and do a lot of damage, so I think the project's a, a winner. And I hope that you'll vote unanimously, unanimously to support the, uh, the document. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is David Van Brink. I'm a resident on the west side of Santa Cruz for the last 31 years. In response to the Sierra Club's concerns about the impacts of the proposed Segment 7 Phase 2 trail, the Sierra Club serves a valuable watchdog role. They scrutinize proposals with respect to their impacts on the environment, and this is laudable. I appreciate the care and attention and thought they put into this. In the case of Segment 7, Phase 2, each of their concerns is, when examined, not substantive. 
Placement of the trail on the south side of the tracks and more importantly, along the outer edge of the entire park and next to the wastewater treatment plant and just inward from Bay Street, not along the lagoon, minimizes the impact to Neary Lagoon wildlife. Tree removal has been minimized in your plan and several sites identified for replacement are being considered following best known practices. Sierra Club has expressed concern in particular about one eucalyptus tree slated for removal. Due to its placement, other trees in the canopy will compensate habitat wise. Sierra Club has expressed concern about various drainage and uh, flooding issues. These are all accounted for uh, in the proposed project with best practices. Lastly, climate change. I find it surprising that the uh, Sierra Club would object to the relatively minor short-term impacts of a construction project whose specific stated purpose is to provide transportation alternatives. The long-term impacts of providing alternatives to fossil fuel transportation surely outweigh the minor short-term localized loss of vegetation. And apart from that, vegetation will be replaced at a different location at a minimum two to one ratio, if I'm reading correctly. The Sierra Club have raised a number of concerns regarding segment seven phase two trail construction. They do provide a valuable counterpoint, but in each case they are making much over small and mitigated issues. Uh, please ignore these comments and approve the rail project, the trail project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Weir. I live on the west side of Santa Cruz as well. I live on California Street, very near the Bay Avenue, uh, Bay Street intersection that we're talking about. Um, and I want to speak just really briefly to some of the social aspects here. Because I'm somebody who's kind of an occasional bicyclist, I'm also a regular walker of Neary Lagoon and uh, La Barranca Park and go down to the wharf all the time, um, either biking or by foot. And right now, I'll tell you that hill, <laughs> both Laurel Street and the hill that goes down by the Dream Inn is a real barrier for somebody like me um, who is not you know, a spandex biker. Um, I, you know, I struggle on that hill and sometimes I end up driving because I just, it's just a little too much. Um, and I see a lot of other people struggling with those hills to come up toward up Bay Avenue, especially if they're heading for Bay School. And I, that's another part of this for me is the so social equity part of this, is that if we have a gradual ADA compliant path that is easily used by anybody coming from the Beach Flats area and up to the west side and back again. To me, that's important because I see people struggle to bring their grandchildren up to base school every day from down in the Beach Flats area. And I think they really deserve to have a safe way to do that. So thank you. I hope you approve this. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Stephen Slade. I'm the executive director of the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. Uh, the Land Trust urges you to uh, accept the staff recommendations and, and approve this project. I will say that we're in favor of trails and protecting the environment too. And it, it seems to me that the, the staff has gone to great lengths to mitigate uh, some clear impacts. But I, I think one of the things I run into all the time is some people seem to think you're supposed to have zero impacts. And I, that's not possible if you're touching the earth. And so that's why we have less than significant impacts. And then you weigh those, we do, against the most important thing the city is doing to address climate change. I mean, the biggest contributor to climate change in this county is transportation. And if you create a 32 mile bike and pedestrian path, you will have an impact. People will get out of their cars and get around. And so this one small segment is one small piece of that larger vision. We bought into that vision. We're supporting it. We put money into it. We're gonna be the site of some of your mitigation happily. And it is not hard to grow willow trees. So we encourage you to keep moving on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Shellhammer. There is a steep decline in monarch, uh, monarchs across the western U.S. The problem is not overwintering capacity along the California coast. Given the decline in the monarch population, we now have vast amounts of excess capacity for overwintering. 
monarchs are in decline because of changes in the inland landscape through which they migrate hundreds of miles. The two greatest causes of monarch decline are climate change and changes to farming practices, all of which deprive monarchs of necessary food uh, during their long inland migration. We are not on that inland migration route, but what we can do is reduce our climate emissions. The rail trail is key to doing that. In Santa Cruz, our biggest climate change problem is our excessive use of cars. We generate more climate change emissions from just the transportation sector than we do from all other sectors combined. The city recognizes the seriousness of this problem by its policy goal of reducing in-town car trips by at least 30%. USDOT estimates that nationally over 40% of car trips are three miles or less. These are the low-hanging fruit for conversion to zero carbon alternatives like walking and biking. The climate change benefit comes from providing what today's non-bikers need to get them to do that short errand without the use of their car. What it takes to do that is well established. Provide them gentle slopes and separation from auto traffic. That is exactly what a paved path in the rail right-of-way does and does it better than anything else. What is most troubling about the opposition to this project is first, that they advocate delay, 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 when the urgency of climate change requires us to move faster, not slower. And secondly, it is increasingly apparent that they are arguing for taking the trail out of the rail right of way and putting it instead on existing streets. These streets are heavily trafficked and often steep in some parts exceeding allowable ADA slope, and would undo exactly what is needed for the climate change benefits, gentle slopes and no cars. The city has designed a path in the rail right of way that reduces impacts to an absolute minimum. The alternative is to do a very large amount of environmental damage by delaying or giving up one of our best tools to reduce climate change emissions. I urge you to approve the mitigated neg deck and get on with this city's best and most popular way to reduce climate change emissions. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Corey Coletti. I am from the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Um, I'm here to represent our agency and urge your support of the staff recommendation. Um, as a reminder to you, the city of Santa Cruz has adopted the master plan for the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, which identifies the coastal rail trail as the spine of a 50-mile corridor and network. Um, that plan was completed in 2013. We did a programmatic EIR at that time in order to um, support streamlined implementation of future trails. We also, in 2013, allocated $4.6 million in federal earmarks towards this project, which the City of Santa Cruz has also contributed local dollars to. Subsequently, we also contributed um, Measure D sales tax funds for. So in total, we've committed over $10 $10 million, um, dollars, which includes funding for ongoing maintenance. Um, as previous speakers have said, this is um, a project that will provide a continuous corridor for bicyclists and pedestrians, a continuous corridor that, that is off the street network. And for new bicyclists and pedestrians, we need to keep them safe and separated from fast-moving vehicles. Additionally, gradients are really important. We need to make it accessible for people to um, be able to ride bikes push their strollers, wheelchairs. The rail corridor is no more 
than a 3% gradient throughout. So it's a very um, inviting corridor. And um, with the greenhouse gas emission goals that we have for our county, as well as the um, goals to increase both the bicycle and pedestrian mode share, this project is vital to our community. The city of Santa Cruz prides itself on the bike mode share, and this project will help it increase that bicycle mode share as well as the pedestrian mode share. Um, we are really pleased to partner with the city of Santa Cruz. They've been great champions for this project. We as the RTC own the rail right of way and um, are the lead agency responsible for imp its implementation with in partnership with the local jurisdictions. So we urge for your support of the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Piet Cannon from Ecology Action. And I, I kind of want to reiterate what some people have already said um, in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions impact of transportation and that in Santa Cruz, biking is a big mode split already. It's like the second out of um, the state in terms of, you know, second to Davis. And so, you know, we can grow that, that increase and get more people on their bikes. And one data point goes back to 2016, and that was when Measure D was passed. And that, that measure allocates uh, funds some $100 million to build the rail trail. So that was a statewide, I mean, a countywide measure that was put, passed by two thirds of the voters. And so if you take segment by segment and you say, well, this segment, you should put it on the street because of X, Y, and Z reason, I mean, soon when you go down the corridor, then half of your rail trail isn't in the rail corridor. And as the speaker said, that the importance is to have a gentle, a gentle grade, which the rail corridor provides, and to be separated from cars. And anybody that's biked up that hill um, along in front of Dream Inn knows that that's not a gentle grade. And that, you know, as, as the speaker has said, kids can't get up there. So put it, keep it in the rail corridor. And so during that Measure D um, ballot initiative, there was a local survey. And they surveyed county voters and they said, you know, what are the things that, you know, you, you would make you ride your bike more? And they said, hey, um, I'm able to ride a bicycle, but I'm not willing. And 60% of the people said that. They said what they wanted was separated facilities from cars. They didn't feel safe riding in traffic. So the rail trail provides that. So I re reiterate, 50% of greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. We have a way to increase the sustainable transportation mode by providing a safe and accessible and flat um, bike and pedestrian trail. So please um, approve with the staff recommendation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Mary Odegaard and I've been happily riding my bike in this county since 1981. And I'm really looking forward to this segment going through sooner than later. I also work with children and it's a joy to ride a bicycle with them and walk with them. And it's so important when it can be taken away from the automobiles, we can walk and ride a bike away from the automobiles. I've enjoyed the river levee for that reason. Um, so please, let's move forward with, on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Virginia Wright, and I've been volunteering with um, to gather postcards. And, and since you didn't say them, I thought I would just come up and speak for all the people I've been speaking with over the last month or so, hundreds of people. So I think we've submitted over uh, close to 500 postcards, people saying, yes, please do the rail, rail trail on this segment, just this segment alone. And I, I want to just a little bit convey their excitement when you talk to people about this at farmer's markets, which I do every weekend, every Sunday morning I go and I set up my little table. People are really excited about it. So I just wanted to sort of communicate that to you and say please support this, because there's a lot of people that would like to use it. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, uh, thanks for this. Um, <clears throat> I'm Bill Cook, uh, lived on the west side for 40 years. Um, the uh, we have a multi-use uh, path now along West Cliff, and uh, it's heavily impacted, and it's about the same width as as this proposed path. Um, 
uh, eight feet is not wide enough. Um, it, it just, it's uh, obsolete before it's built. $10 million, uh, it's not gonna be $10 million, it's gonna be 15, 20. Um, we're the first dog out of the gates in this race. Um, and uh, there's a lot of problems with throughout the corridor that are unaddressed. Uh, uh, they, um, we're, we're going the long way around the teapot looking for the handle. Um, we're, all this effort is in service to retaining an obsolete rail track that's, um, that's it's an, an environmental problem. It's, um, if you're a turtle, you can't get over those things. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we do we do need protected bicycle infrastructure. Uh, I'm an avid rider. Um, it's uh, it's this is too soon, and it's not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm Sally Arnold, board chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. And I urge you to approve segment seven, phase two, and its proposed alignment along the tracks. Of course, all the segments of the rail trail are important, but there are some that are particularly important because they replace an awkward or dangerous alternative. Widening the San Lorenzo trestle bridge is one of those. Segment seven, phase two is another. The proposed location for this provides a gentle slope connecting the west side to the wharf area. And when it's completed, it will provide an important alternative to the steep and often slimy climb up, of, up Laurel Street or the hill in front of the Dream Inn that has a particularly awkward traffic pattern and is exacerbated by the profusion of confused tourists who stand in the existing two-way bikeway or they drive erratically across the lanes of traffic, endangering the cyclists and pedestrians alike. I go through there often, and I know. Um, neither of those routes is anything like ADA compliant. The proposal to relocate this section of the trail to Bay Street is problematic. Cyclists and pedestrians are still faced with the danger of the Dream, I Dream Inn Hill, and they will be traveling alongside fast-moving cars. I remember about 15 years ago when I began to start cycling around town and not using my car so much, driving in that bike lane on Bay was scary. It felt like the cars were passing fast and close. And then when I got to the Dream Inn, dodging the tourists on foot or in their, in their cars was hair-raising. I've become adept at negotiating those challenges now, but not everybody is that determined to bicycle. Some people are just gonna give up. The point of the rail trail is to provide a safe place for the timid, the young, the old, the new cyclist to get around town without a car. Sending them down Bay Street does not help. I'd also like you to think about the disabled. The slope of West Cliff from Bay to the Wharf is steep. And if we choose that alignment, we're telling our disabled friends and neighbors that they don't count that they don't deserve to move around our community independently. Any effort to reduce the, those challenges is gonna be an engineering nightmare. I'm not saying it's impossible, I'm just saying it's gonna take off forever and be super expensive. Why spend that time and money when we already own a gentle car-free right-of-way? It's not, I mean, it is habitat, but it's already really disturbed habitat. I know that some environmental concerns have been brought up with this right of way, and I just want to clarify that the exact location of this proposed alignment is not next to Neary Lagoon. It's squeezed between the sewage treatment plant and Bay Street. And if you look on the map or those overhead views, you can see there are acres of concrete and machinery and roads between the right of way and the lagoon. That plant is filled with activity and filled with lights. Any additional, additional lights and activity along the proposed trail will not be next to the lagoon itself and are gonna be insignificant compared to the concurrent level of activity that the sewage treatment plant is. So please approve the trail as designed along the right of way because we need segment 7B especially. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Janneke Strauss. I'm the executive director of Bike Santa Cruz County. And Bike Santa Cruz County has been advocating for a trail in the rail corridor since 1992. And as you can see from the correspondence that is part of tonight's agenda packet, the community wants this trail built as soon as possible. And to achieve the city's climate action goals and increase bike ridership, we must target the members of our community who do not currently ride their bikes. 
the top reason those individuals do not ride bikes is because they feel unsafe to do so. The National Association of City Transportation Officials says that nearly two thirds of the adult population may be interested in riding more often given better places to ride. The rail trail has the potential to drastically increase bike ridership because it provides a direct and flout, flat route for cyclists completely separate from cars. The rail trail is a facility that parents will feel comfortable letting their kids ride on by themselves. It's a facility that individuals who don't currently feel comfortable riding on the roadway will ride. City staff have done an amazing job at delivering truly a world-class project. Through the design process, they've also listened to the com community and they've made changes. Bike Santa Cruz County urges you to move this project forward so that we can start riding on it soon. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rachel O'Malley, and I first want to apologize. I think that it was Mark Twain who said, I would have written a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. Um, I know that I filled your uh, packets with a very long letter, and I, I, I recognize how hard that is for you, so sorry. Um, that being said, I, um, I, I'm a biologist, as you know, and I, have, I got my BA in 19, no, yes, 1986, and I, PhD in 1997, so I've been doing this for a very long time, and I did l review all of the um, documents that were provided for this project, and I was r quite alarmed in part because I also teach environmental impact assessment, and I was specifically alarmed because there are um, specific required mitigations in the program EIR for riparian habitat loss that were not, in fact, incorporated into this project. So I, I see the city as being at some risk for that deficiency, but I also wanted to just point out um, a couple of important biological impacts that this project will have. Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, two bat species were identified in the um, document that was put out about this. In fact, Santa Cruz County has potential for 15 bat species and they have to be sur surveyed acoustically. We don't see them. We can't just look for them. This site is important. It would be easy to do um, if there were other bat species. It's actually called out in the FEIR for the um, rail trail that an acoustic survey will be done. There may be one. It's not been provided to the public. And this is one of my concerns is that the documentation about the effects of this project on the rail trail feels hasty. It feels as though some are on this, on, on the Mira Lagoon ecosystem. It feels like it was, uh, foregone conclusion. Um, and honestly, the impacts for this project, because it is right next to the Neary Lagoon, which has incredible wildlife species, that's just bats. Um, we've talked about butterflies, which are in the area. This was actually on one of the willows that will be removed. Um, butterflies are using the nectar from willows, their, their historic nectar sources. We, uh, that corridor, this is in, this looks just like the sites that we've seen. This is in the uh, gray fox, and you can see right here, this is Bay Street. This is the, the, the site of the, um, the proposed trail. Um, similarly, this is a wetland species up and down. This is, this is the side, the south side of the tracks that will be turned into that vertical corridor. When animals come across through the pervious uh, um, wires, they'll hit a steep wall. We know what happens on Highway 17 when animals come through something and hit a wall. They no longer can actually move around and go up. So it, in fact, will be a trap. It'll be a path, a trap. Anyways, um, I wanted to encourage you to look at the uh, document that I've sent um, and specifically consider moving the, sorry, I just want to show you this one picture. This is the the kind of a separated trail that could be along, not where the path is in La Barranca Park, but between Bay and La Barranca Park. Bay Street needs to be calmed anyways. We've got projects going on at the bottom of Bay. So there's a lot of opportunities with the enormous amount of money that's gonna be spent removing the fill and removing the, rather the, the cut. That money could be spent better for things that benefit the whole community. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, good evening. My name is Matt Farrell. I live on the east side of Santa Cruz. I'd like to speak in support of staff recommendation and supporting the mitigated negative declaration. I think that um, the corridor along the alignment as proposed has significant benefits for circulation and uh, an example of that impact and benefit has been clear in my neighborhood on the east side with the approval and development of the Rana Gulch bike pathway that provides a separate corridor for transportation for bicyclists and pedestrians aside from the road system. And riding along many, many times in West Cliff, I agree that that alignment is problematic for those goals. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else who would like to speak on this issue this evening? Okay, seeing none, we're going to close the public comment period and we're going to see if staff has any comments they'd like to make before we open it for deliberations. And um, I'd just like to make um, just some clarifying comments about how we did do our um, how we came to our impacts. So, is that uh, your name for us? Uh, sorry, my name is Leo Mena, um, and so um, under CEQA, one the impacts that we have to analyze is whether a project would result in a substantial adverse effect on both species that are considered special status um, because of they are listed by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and in the case of the monarch butterfly, listed in the general plan. Um, and also for natural communities of concern and riparian habitat. So the threshold for an impact under CEQA is whether a project would result in a substantial adverse effect on special status species and um, sensitive communities when it comes to these biological resources. So I'd just like to emphasize that what our document um, is doing is using that threshold and our conclusions are based on whether or not a project the, the, it, the project would result in a substantial adverse effect on, for example, monarch butterfly or um, the riparian uh, habitat. So that's, that's, that's where, where this document um, is coming from and that's what we've done in describing the, um, the low quality of the habitat um, in the eucalyptus grove as well as the lack of uh, documentation of it being an overwintering site and the fact that there's just we're just removing, um, in the case of the monarch butterfly habitat, 5% of the total grove and in the case of the riparian area, 2.5% of the total habitat in the area. So I just want to make that clarification. Thank you. Okay, so let's bring it back to the commission. Somebody like to start? I guess yeah. I'm willing. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you everybody who came uh, to speak and for your thoughtful consideration. I just would really like to echo many of the comments that were made tonight. I think it is really exciting to be at this point with this segment. Um, I appreciate the uh, consideration of the alternatives, but um, I agree that the, the chosen uh, design is by far uh, the most accessible and going to achieve the goals of, of um, getting more people on their bikes and out of their cars. I look forward to it very much myself. Um, and I also really appreciate the, that uh, the city took the time uh, when the Sierra Club raised concerns and found a way to save additional trees. Um, I think that speaks well of our community and um, it, it did take some extra time. I know a lot of us are anxious to see it going, uh, get this get going, but um, taking the time to consider that, uh, to design to save additional trees, I feel like it was respectful of the community process that I appreciate that about Santa Cruz. Um, so thank you for that, and um, let's get going. This is a difficult um, decision for me because it really is two decisions. One decision is 
uh, decision having to do with the minor land uh, mitigated negative declaration, and the other is the project. And under the California Environmental Quality Act, we're not uh, able to uh, take an action on the project until we take an action on the environmental document. And so the question, really, the first question is, is the proposed mitigated negative declaration sufficient? And I teach a class in environmental assessment, and I tend to be, uh, I think of myself as a strict constructionalist under CEQA. But it's also because following CEQA over the years and the uh, cases around CEQA is that there is a real difference when uh, under CEQA and when a uh, mitigated or a negative declaration or a mitigated negative declaration is uh, proposed versus when an environmental impact is proposed. It may have been talked about before, but under CEQA there's something called a fair argument standard. And that's the standard that, that is used to determine whether uh, a negative declaration or mitigated neg negative declaration is the appropriate environmental document or an EIR needs to be prepared. And that fair argument standard, which is a very con controversial part of CEQA, says if there is a fair argument based on uh, substantial evidence in light of the whole record, that there may, not that there will, but that, that there may be a significant impact from the project, uh, an EIR should be done. So that's what confronted me in trying to come to terms with what should be done here, because I, I am a strong supporter of the project, and I'm a supporter of this um, of this segment and the, and the proposal that's before us. But I am concerned that we have a legal obligation to follow the requirements of CEQA. So there are really two, um, two aspects of that. One is, has the city provided substantial evidence uh, to document their determination that after mitigation, there are not potentially significant impacts? The other question is, has uh, information been presented to the city that uh, those challenging the mitigated negative declaration, have they provided substantial uh, uh, evidence that even that there is that there is the potential for a significant impact? First letter that um, the was received from the Sierra Club, I think um, raised these kinds of issues, argued that there were significant impacts, and talked about what the, what the uh, conclusions were that the, an EIR was required. The staff uh, responded to that in detail, uh, arguing that, their, that the challenge was, did not really provide substantial evidence. What we received tonight or a, few, a couple of days ago was an expanded uh, letter raising additional potentially significant impacts that, um, that could result from the project. The staff has not had a chance to respond to those, and I'm, a, I'm concerned about that. I want to ask some questions about uh, in response to the letter that we received because I think it's important to have on the record that if, if there isn't substantial evidence that there's a potential of a for a significant impact, then the mitigated, mitigated negative declaration is appropriate and an EIR isn't necessary. But I think there needs to be a response from the staff that really justifies that conclusion. One question I had had to do with something I hadn't thought of before but was raised a couple of times, one in the letter and one in the testimony, and that has to do with the role of the programmatic EIR for the, uh, for the trail as a whole, the, the master plan for the rail trail, and the concern that mitigations that were in that EIR were not included as mitigations in the, um, in the, in the mitigated neg negative declaration that's before us. So I'd like to sort of have an explanation about why they weren't included or whether they can still be included. I mean, what is the status of those, uh, of, of those mitigations? Because my, uh, the testimony, anyway, was that they were relevant to the potential impacts of this particular segment. So 
I don't know if you can answer that question. I'd appreciate it. My name is, I'll, I'll read my name. I'm, I'm Leo Mena. Um, I, I, will tr I will try my best. Okay. <laughs> so um, in, the, in our ISMND, our approach to um, determining that impact was primarily based on the assessment that was made by the biologists about the, um, the suitability of that habitat. And we doc document that it is a low quality habitat and that there is invasive species there and that's really separated from the main habitat um, with that compacted railroad that has gone through it. So that's where we're coming from where we're assessing that that's an impact of, that that's an area of low quality. And in terms of your question about um, the, the, the mitigation in the, in the programmatic um, EIR, I think the, C, uh, the city is the lead agency determined that they were gonna implement the mitigation measures um, for the willow trees. And that was pr primarily um, a result of that consultation with um, Caltrans, who in turn consulted with uh, the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife Service. So that mitigation was really developed as a site-specific thing rather than, you know, this a programmatic EIR is for a, a larger idea of a project. The, and we were, we were being more site-specific. So I'm, I hope that answers your question. It really came out of a, that consultation with Caltrans, who in turn consulted with so U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I'm understanding what you're saying, uh, the city decided not to tier its environmental review off the programmatic EIR. Having made that decision, it was not responsible for including the mitigations from that EIR in the, and the city decided to do an independent analysis of the potential impacts of this project, and that's what was looked at. That's correct. The document is not tiered from the EIR. Okay, well, don't go away yet, because okay. I have a few more questions. Um, one of them has to do with this uh, question about the bat species mm -hmm. um, and the lack of acoustical surveys and how many bat species there are um, in Miri Lagoon. Mm -hmm. um, what's your response to the, 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 the testimony that there's a potentially significant impact on the bat species that the city hasn't really done, provided sub, uh, substantial evidence that there won't be a significant impact. Now, there isn't evidence in the record that there will be a significant mm -hmm. impact, so I think, but it does raise a question and it is an issue that the city should respond to. Yeah, um, okay, I will try to answer your question again. So, um, and I'll give you some context about how we got to where we got in terms of our, our, our list of species that were determined to be potentially impacted by the project. So the way in which we prepared um, our ISMND in determining what species could be impacted was by reviewing um, established databases that define special status species. Uh, I guess I'll remind everyone here that when we're talking about bats, we're talking about bats that are considered special status species as um, as required under CEQA. The, the, the threshold here is whether a project would have a substantial adverse effect on a species that is considered sensitive by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, or other, um, or, 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 you know, the city. Um, and so that list was um, we, we queried several um, databases, including the CNDDB, which is maintained by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which is the California Natural Diversities Database, as well as a species list from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that records um, federally endangered um, and threatened species. So we did that work, and that's a part of, uh, we cite that in the ISMND as, as, as how we uh, identified which species could potentially be affected, and so, that, so that's how we got to to those species because those are the ones that we've identified as being special status. That being said, our mitigation um, for pre-construction surveys um, is for um, for 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 all bats, I believe. Um, can I just look at the document real quick? Sure. If I could point you to mitigation measure, one sec, bio four, um, we say um, 
identify suitable roosting habitat for bats and implement avoidance and protective measures. Um, and I could, uh, I can read you what it says, but essentially it's that um, the project will require um, certain pre-construction surveys prior to the construction of the project. And if um, any species are found, uh, certain measures will be taken in order to protect those species. And that is inclusive of not just the special status species that were identified, but which are the pallid bat and the hoary bat, but um, all bats. So does that, does that answer your question? I think so. Uh, what you're, if I'm understanding you, what you're saying is that some bat species aren't considered sensitive uh, species. That's correct. And despite that, there are there is a mitigation measure to minimize any potential impact to a less than significant level for any sensitive bat species that may be there. Correct. And I'll just um, I'll give another example. Birds. There are a lot of different kinds of birds. Some are considered special status because they are listed by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife as endangered, threatened, or special species of pet special concern. Some are classified by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as federally endangered or threatened. So those are the species that we do call out as being that are the special status species that we look into because that's what the secret threshold is. But our mitigation measure includes um, includes mitigation for all nesting birds, um, and that's yeah. So I'll just I'll just it's similar with the bats. I guess I won't go through all of these. Uh, I'm I'm concerned though that the letter that we received that Ms. O'Malley you know sort of gave a brief summary of does raise a number of potentially significant issues, just like the original Sierra Club um, letter did. Yeah. I don't, I'm not gonna suggest that we uh, delay this to um, get a written response to each of them, but I think it's important that, um, one, to respond to the, to the person who raised these uh, about what the concerns were, yeah. and two, if this is a, P, if our decision it, is to support the recommendations, uh, and it is appealed. I think when this goes to the city council, there needs to be a written response yeah. to all of this because, as I said, CEQA's threshold for requiring an EIR, as you know, mm -hmm. is very low, and it's not just that the city has substantial evidence, but that the challenges don't have substantial evidence. Mm -hmm. And um, I. My sense is that there isn't a feasible alternative to go through the process of writing an EIR. We'll delay things. We'll be right back here. The city uh, um, has agreed to follow the master plan. I don't see any evidence that that's going to change. I think it would be very unfortunate if the city was challenged in this. I walk around Neary Lagoon probably three or four times a week. There are always bicyclists that go by me. Um, two or three at least each time. And they're not good, they're not safe for the poor souls who are walking, but they're certainly not good for the wildlife either banging on the, on the uh, walkway. I think this project will have <coughs> safety benefits. I won't repeat a lot of the testimony we received about those, those benefits. Um, I think this is an important project. It is an expensive project, but to provide these kinds of um, amenities is expensive and they'll last a long time and I think they could really change people's th behavior in a, in a desirable way. So despite the fact that I'm concerned about the, the sequel implications of um, the, the, the letters that we've received and the potential that um, it, they do justify, um, city carrying out a, 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 an environmental impact report based on the staff recommendation, based on your recommendation, and based on kind of an understanding that um, the letter that we received late when you really didn't have time to respond to it in detail will be responded to. Um, I, I, I'm prepared to support the staff recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Robert? 
I'd just like to say that um, I too am also uh, inclined to support the staff recommendation. Um, I think it's a, a great project. It's been a long time coming. Uh, years and years, if not decades, of planning have been before this, uh, this particular segment as well. Um, and while I appreciate the, the city responding to the initial correspondence with the Sierra Club, I'm not very compelled by the additional testimony that's been offered and the additional correspondence. Um, and I'm inclined to support the city staff's findings um, and move forward with the project plan. So that's all. Thank you. Um, thanks, yeah, I really appreciated all of the testimony this mm -hmm. evening. Um, and I know that we all uh, did our best to, to read all of the correspondence and the, um, and the new report. And, um, you know, I'd like to learn more. Um, I think that I was really um, appreciative of both that Sierra Club report as well as Leo Mena's uh, response to it and found it interesting that there's a distinction made between special status species um, that were really studied um, in terms of the consideration around significant adverse effects or substantial adverse effects. Um, and that I find to be an important, you know, point in addition to the fact that mitigation efforts are going to be made for all species. Um, and then I also think about this project, which I'm very impressed by in relation to, you know, kind of multi-scalar environmental effects. So the fact that we will have a potentially really quite um, profound impact on local travel patterns and greenhouse gas emissions at the local scale can also affect travel patterns at larger scales and can mean that we're also preventing adverse effects on habitat at larger scales. So it's important to think about, you know, containing local travel patterns here on, through alternative methods in thinking about kind of larger regional effects as well, not just our local habitat, but our larger regional habitat. So I see, um, you know, this, this entire trail project and this segment of it as enormously significant for non-human and human uh, species, um, for our own travel patterns, for uh, also for, for the environment, um, at both in terms of wildlife um, conservation and um, in terms of preventing sprawl and containing development here in the, at the, in the city, as well as for greenhouse gas emissions. And I think um, it has significant equity implications, as were mentioned in some of the correspondence in terms of connecting, for instance, the Beach Flats area to the west side and enabling um, much more kind of transit between those areas as well as people's ability to bring people to bring their children to schools. And just speaking personally, um, my daughter goes to um, Santa Cruz High and has refused, and, and she went to Mission Hill and has refused to bike um, for years um, as a result of her fear of the traffic. And I understand that. And I myself am a, um, someone mentioned, you know, the importance of timid bikers um, getting on the roads and everything and have had to overcome a lot of my own personal fears. And I think this is gonna have, again, a really profound effect socially um, and for our community um, in terms of the, the equity implications um, for people of different ages, abilities, as well as regions of the city. So I, I support the staff recommendations. Thank you. Christian. Um, I'd like to, I mean, I agree with a lot. I mean, pretty much everything you just said. Uh, um, and I would like to thank everybody for coming out as well. I, um, it's great to have the the, um, the public come out and and um, share their thoughts on on you know on things that are in front of us, such as this. Um, and it's and it's great to hear that actually it's everybody was somewhat in support. I mean, well, everyone's in support of the of uh, the project in some way, um, you know. But it's it's great to to hear everybody everybody's um, opinions. Um, I would like to just, I'd actually like to reiterate some of the things I did hear tonight, um, some of the things that kind of hit me and that I, um, that um, kind of lead me to my position of, of being in favor of this project. Um, first thing being bicycle, bicycle safety. Uh, I, I think everybody ha has spoken to that. Um, about you know getting getting bikes away from uh, vehicular traffic, um, 
making it more safe, uh, making it more safe um, for um, for young and for old, and um, and with the um, with the path and the gradient being what it is, it does allow for uh, ADA access and um, accessibility for all um, on the path. And I think that's important. I think that's an important reason um, why I feel like this is a um, a better option than. Um, trying to go down Bay and then um, down West Cliff. Um, emergency vehicle access, I think it's, uh, I think that's extremely important. And, um, you know, for, um, uh, for, uh, for um, pedestrian and, and bicycle um, um, safety um, on the trail and also for uh, fire access as well. I think that's um, also a very important thing and, and I'm glad um, that that's planned for in this uh, in this plan, um, and oh, and then um, and then the so social equity component I, I think is um, is extremely important, I, especially when we look at the when we look at this plan from a macro level. I mean, uh, the the ability of getting a uh, a bike a, a, a you know rail and um, bike trail down. From Davenport down to Wattsville, I think it's a it's a great thing, and um, you know this being one small piece in that, but it's an important piece, and and um, but each one is um, each one is going to be an important um, you know thing to happen. So I'm excited about that. So I'm fully in support of this. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of that testimony. I think I share Commissioner Schifrin's um, kind of dual um, analysis of this. On, on some level, this could very easily have been a very easily approved project and we miss an opportunity to really dig in and understand what the real impacts of this project are. As I read through these documents, which were you know quite numerous for this, um, hearing this evening, I got the sense that one, we had some very engaged citizens on some very important issues, but the document and the mitigations that are in place that should be triggered if habitats are disturbed to a level that um, are problematic, that those things are in place in that document. And it took quite a bit of reading in those documents to actually get to that understanding. And I think it was the interaction with the Sierra Club and the back and forth that happened. So it wasn't a one-sided, we think there's these impacts and we're not addressing it. There were significant design changes that reduced uh, automatically a significant portion of that impact. And I think, you know, again, at the 11th hour, we had other correspondence back and forth that showed that the city was still responding uh, and open to those ideas. Uh, I'm satisfied that the document has some teeth in it, and if there are impacts that become unraveled as this thing moves forward, we have the vehicle to to address that and, and make the appropriate, um, you know, decisions on the project at that point. I was also curious. I forgot to ask of staff in in the conditions of approval for the project. I had never seen a condition worded quite like this, but it says, if upon exercise of this permit, this use is at any time determined by the Planning Commission to be incompatible with the surrounding neighborhood, revocation of or amendment to this permit by the Planning Commission could occur. Um, that's a boilerplate condition uh, with every use permit for every development that we approve. Okay, well. <laughs> That's Give embarrassing, it, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the planning department doesn't treat the public works department any different from anybody I, else. I, 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 um, you know, from a community standpoint, I, there's so many benefits to this. I think even people that are concerned about the potential impacts have, have made those points. Um, my concern for the, the timid is is well stated this evening, but I'm also concerned about, I have a teenager at Santa Cruz High who loves to ride the jump bikes with sometimes two and three people on them. And 
you know, if we can keep them off the streets, uh, <laughs> I think many of us would sleep, sleep better at night. Uh, I don't think that's going to change. I mean, I think we're going to see more, more of that. Hopefully, we have better habits in how we use that you know, new form of transportation, let's call it. Um, but I think it's, it's here to stay based on you know, how, how the community has really bought into it. So this piece, the, the full extent of the trail is, is going to you know, enhance the quality of life in Santa Cruz significantly. So I'm, I'm in support. Um, I feel there is appropriate mitigation and, and controls put in the, in the mitigated negative deck and I support the, the staff's recommendations. Yes. Yeah, I, I want to thank the staff for all their work. I also want to thank the Sierra Club for their work on the project. Um, I think every concern that was raised is a legitimate concern. Uh, I think that raising them has had the, uh, the effect of making this a better project, as you said. I really you know, agree with your point about that. It's a more environmentally sensitive project. And I think it's also imp uh, improved the analysis of the impacts as the city has had to develop better evidence to support the, uh, support the conclusions. So I would, uh, I would make a motion that we approve the staff recommendations for this project, but I'd like to add a direction that staff provide a detailed response to the late, uh, late received Sierra Club letters uh, that would go uh, to the writers and if the project is appealed to the city council so that the, the, there would be the, uh, you know, a, a written response to the written concerns that were raised. So that's my motion. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any further discussion around that point? I have a, just a concern about the... Um, directing the response. I mean, I, I, we heard staff say earlier that there would be a response. Um, I, I um, was a little bit concerned about a detailed response being, I would like the level of response to be the appropriate one that the, that staff finds. So I, I asked <clears throat> that this be dropped off on all of your mm -hmm. desks. Yeah. Commissioner Schiffer, did you get this? Yes, I did. Okay. So that is the response from the most recent letters this week. And for me, oh, I'm sorry. So what, what I was going to say is that um, I appreciate that there was, because I think it was a pretty um, um, fast piece of work to be to respond. And I felt like like, uh, um, it, that, like that the response was there. I, I myself feel satisfied and I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by detailed response. I don't know what the staff burden clarify. is going to be um, on that in terms of, I, I certainly would want to have a um, response that's necessary, um, but I don't feel prepared to know what that is. Well, I thought the staff response to the original Sierra Club letter was exactly what I had in mind, where it went through issue by issue and responded to it and talked about why Either the evidence uh, wasn't didn't raise a substantial didn't it didn't provide substantial evidence, or that uh, it didn't it didn't meet the uh, the uh, the requirements of CEQA. Justifying a negative declaration in the face of an expert uh, expert testimony that is detailed and specific to what the potentially significant effects are is of great concern to me. Mm -hmm. I think that under CEQA, you know, it, I talked about this in my class and one of the students said, well, why don't they just do the EIR? And judges tend to say that. It's not like the city's going to turn down the project, but if there's the potential of a significant impact, there may be one, then <coughs> the judge will say, do an EIR. And my concern is this is fine as a quick response to a very detailed, um, you know, we received a 111-page document, 14-page letter. Um, I think it deserves and needs a more detailed response. And the model in my mind is the response to the first letter. I thought that was an excellent response on the part of staff to the specific concerns raised in that letter. And 
if this goes forward, um, and I don't know whether it will or not, I hope it doesn't, but if it does, then ultimately, uh, and if the council acts the same way we did, and they, the, the Sierra Club decides to challenge that, we're going to need to have evidence in the record that we took seriously what the <laughs> concerns were, and we and the city really looked at them and responded to them very specifically for some judge to just say, okay, I, I think the city has adequately shown that the challenges haven't re provided substantial evidence that there's a potentially significant mm -hmm. effect. And mm -hmm. I don't think this does it. Okay. Um, it starts to do it. But that's why I'm concerned there wasn't enough time, and uh, it, it needs a more thoughtful response. And I really do appreciate your concern. Of course, I always appreciate your insights. Um, and I um, also think that we all would want any challenge that should ever come. Hopefully one won't come. Um, because I do think there's been a very serious effort um, to satisfy the community and take a look at it. And I don't disagree with um, a, a response, but I, I think that the um, response that I would be looking for, and it might, it really might not be very different from what you're requesting, is that, you know, staff and the consultants take a look and respond appropriately to all concerns that were raised because, I mean, we do want them to be responded to, we would want this to support. I don't think we're very different. It's more kind of a, a slowing down, I guess, is my concern. Okay. Um, I'm not sure there's much of a difference between an appropriate response and a detailed response, because from my perspective, the staff made a very appropriate response to mm -hmm. the original letter. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you mean by an appropriate mm -hmm. response, then I'm happy to change the motion to say appropriate response, because that's exactly what I mean. Okay, good. So um, so would you accept a friendly amendment to, uh, I, to the change yeah, to an appropriate? If it's mm -hmm. acceptable to the second, I would change the word to from detailed to appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Is that good with you? Okay. Any more discussion? So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Schifrin? Aye. Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Hepping? Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Singleton? Aye. So that motion passes unanimously. And uh, could I ask that uh, we take a five minute break? Mm -hmm. Sure. Use the facilities. <laughs> yeah. Let's Thank do that. <laughs> We do have two more items on our agenda tonight. If people are not going to, whatever. They turned off the mic. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Are we good? Okay. All right, welcome back, everyone. We do have two items on our general business agenda tonight. And the first is the 2018 General Plan and Housing Element Annual Progress Report. Do you have a staff report on that? Yes, we do. Uh, good evening, commissioners and Vice Chair Spellman. Uh, my name is Sarah Fleming, and I'm principal planner overseeing the long range planning and policy team here with the planning department. So each year, we report to the state on our implementation efforts related to our housing element and our general plan. Uh, the reports are due to the Department of Housing uh, and Community Development, or HCD, and the Office of Planning and Research, or OPR, by April 1st of each year. The reports must be presented to City Council before being submitted, and we also provide the report to Planning Commission after submittal, uh, generally for your information and edification. Uh, reports were presented to Council at the March 21st, 2019 meeting, and then were scheduled to be provided to Planning Commission at one of the two April meetings, so since this is the first April meeting, uh, we're bringing it to you here. The only April meeting, that's correct. <laughs> The uh, uh, March 21st meeting, council directed staff to bring this back, uh, which we had planned to do. And at that same meeting, they also asked us to provide the general plan policies related to corridors and golf club drive uh, to the commission. Those items are not included as a part of today's report. However, I do want you to know that they are in the queue. Our small but mighty team uh, has a number of long range planning items in the hopper that council has requested of us and uh, in advance of that item. And so as we clear those out, the, the next direction in the queue will come up. 
Uh, so the PowerPoint presentation uh, given to City Council was included as an attachment in your packet, and both Catherine Donovan and myself are here to answer any questions that you might have about the standard report. Thank you. Yep. Do commissioners have questions for staff? Yes. Um, you went you talk pretty fast. So and I I'm tried to sure. talk slowly. <laughs> I, let me just clarify. You did refer to the corridor policies and the golf club drive policies. That's and correct. And you said they were in the queue. That's correct. Okay. Well, what, can you talk about what's in the queue or when, what does that mean in terms of when they're going to come before the commission to sure. discuss? Um, so it really depends on council direction uh, in terms of anything additional that they add to the queue. Right now our team is working on a bunch of Housing Blueprint subcommittee items that were approved at the June 12th meeting of last year. And so we have a bunch of that stuff in the hopper. We're also working on all the rental housing task force stuff that has come forward after the failure of Measure M. Council has asked our team to move forward with convening a, um, well, I shouldn't say that. We have brought on a consultant to help us do a situation assessment of our um, rental housing situation, and that very likely will turn into a task force uh, in June or something like that. Uh, and then we also have a, a host of other initiatives that council has asked us to do since then that are in the hopper before this item. So, and then add to that our general plan implementation items as well. We have a LCP update that we're working on, a general plan update that we're working on, things of that nature. What role does the commission have, if any, um, in terms of being able to affect the queue? Um, is it just a matter of recommending to the council that they give a higher priority to some issue as opposed to another issue? That probably that would, would be. be our, that would be our role. That probably because, would be the I best mean, way to do it. I'm concerned about the lack of consistency between the corridor policies and the general plan and the zoning ordinance. I think that's a disservice to the community. It's a disservice to potential property, to property owners and potential developers. It's been sitting there for quite a while without it being resolved. It, it, um, it has. So what I'm wondering is, it may not, since you didn't put this on the agenda, you decided even though the council asked you to send this to us, it's not on the agenda, would it be appropriate to ask that it come back so that we could discuss our, the commission could discuss how important we think it is and whether we would like to ask the council for some direction in terms of giving one or the other. The other concern I have is Golf Club Drive, where there's supposed to be an area plan. Nothing's happening on the area plan. And I understand a work program has priorities. Uh, priorities change over time. Absolutely. Councils change over time. So it's a question of um, council deciding what the priorities are. And I think in asking that the corridor uh, policies and the golf club drive policies come to the, you know, be included in the annual report, it's, it's sending a message, at least to me, that, that's, that those are priorities for us to talk about. So to be told that, well, we'll talk about them when you get around to being able to have us talk about them, doesn't seem to be following the council direction, and it doesn't seem to be giving the commission the role that the council wanted the commission to have. Sure. So I have a just a couple of responses. Um, first, I want to be careful that we don't speak too much about this because it hasn't been agendized. So I just want us to be uh, the commission to be careful ab about that. Um, that said, I, I do want to clarify there wasn't an indication that the two needed to come together. The uh, submission of the HCD annual report, the housing an annual report, and um, general plan annual report, and we had already had that in the queue to come to you. So we didn't want to delay bringing that to you because of the work and the effort that we needed to undertake to pull the other items together. Uh, and we, I didn't get a sense from council that the direction was that they needed to come together. So we wanted to go ahead and bring this as it was already in the queue and it was ready to come forward. And again, if um, either you, the commission would like to agendize having a conversation about those items uh, or agendize to council to prioritize that, I think that's absolutely something that's 
you know, within the, the realm of possibility. Um, we are just responding the best that we can to the multiple demands that we have with the limited resources that we have. So um, please know that we are um, working very concertedly on a daily basis to do as much as we can. Um, but candidly, there are me overseeing a team of two full-time planners, and we have a very, very hefty workload. So it is not an attempt to not bring it forward. It's just that it's in the queue uh, with a litany of other items. So I would recommend that I do think it's an important issue. I do think there is community interest in understanding where we are with our corridor process. And the golf club drive is another specific area that has been out there uh, for quite some time. And it'd be interesting to know where that stands. So I think it's to get an update that's more um, clarifying for the commission and we could potentially deliberate and make a recommendation. I think it would be important to agendize that at a fairly soon meeting. If we have a light agenda at some point, we can add that too. I think that makes sense. I could follow up. Yeah, I, there, there's no question that the staff works hard and that you're overworked and you have too much and there's a, always a tendency to have pile on. There's more requests than you can meet. But it also, it, it all comes down to a prioritization. Mm -hmm. And periodically, it makes sense to look at that prioritization and see whether it's things still should be prioritized the way they have been prioritized. That's a very fair point. And I think that that's, you know, as you know, to look at this from my perspective, mm -hmm. which tends to be a political perspective, the, you know, the, the visit, there was a, there's been a change on the council. And whether, you know, the priorities of this council are the same as the previous council, um, we'll find out. But certainly it's legitimate to talk about that. So that's why I think, in my sense, in the fact that they asked that these be considered as part of the general plan annual report, is kind of raising the flag that this is something they want to see discussed. So I agree with uh, our chair tonight that I know we can't really talk about them tonight. That's fine. Uh, they're not on the agenda. So I'm happy, I, you know, I would request that they be brought back sooner rather than later, just to this, not to resolve, because I don't think we should be talking about resolving them, but to maybe ask the council how they want, how, what kind of priority do they want to give these uh, two general plan issues? Yes. And you know, does what is, and then you can tell the council, well, if you tell us to do this, we're not going to be able to do that. And that's what is the appropriate thing. And I think I completely agree with you to be very candid. Um, the corridors process, picking that back up was next in the queue for my team that was pushed back by the rental housing task force work. And so they have made it clear to us that that is their priority right now. And so the, the staffer that I had that was going to be working on corridors, has been pulled to the rental housing task force efforts. So again, if council wants to have a conversation and reprioritize that, that is absolutely within their purview, but that is where we're sitting with it, with it right now. So until that work is done and on a solid track, the staffer who is going to be working on that can't pick it back up. The rental housing task force effort is on, on track. So without additional resources, it's it's something that, again, not to push back, but it is in the queue, and council's realigned our priorities with the rental housing task force effort, and that's what we're focused on right now. Okay. Okay, well, I've, I'm not hearing you disagree that this could come back quickly for us to discuss and to ask the council um, what they want to do, how they want to clarify it. Sure. If you want to agendize, I think, an item to make a recommendation to council for them to clarify, I think that can be done relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of coming back with the full discussion, we're still in the same situation with limited resources and limited staffing. And so then they'll need to let us know which thing they'd like us to move forward on first, the rental housing task force or the corridors item. And golf I club have drive. I sense that there are other options available as well if they decide to make that. Of course. I mean, although they are absolutely, we take direction from council, and if they have another way they'd like us to pursue it, we're absolutely willing to do that. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Are there any more comments on the housing element information? I do, but I maybe we should hear from the public first. Uh, Certainly. Let's do that. Is it... 
Is it a public hearing item? It doesn't need to be a public hearing, but if you remember from our next yeah, item, certainly. the if public has the right to talk on any item on the we agenda. We will do that. So if there are folks in the audience that would like to speak on this item, please sign in on the right and state your name for us as you speak. And we'll give everyone two minutes apiece. Thank you. Mr. Acting Chair and members of the commission, Gary Patton, I'm here on behalf of Save Santa Cruz. I did send in a letter by email. I provided, it. okay, I didn't know that. Uh, I know you got a lot of correspondence I heard from the last item. Uh, your discussion uh, just previously really responds to the concern I wanted to raise. Uh, Save Santa Cruz has been concerned and is very concerned about this general plan zoning ordinance inconsistency relating to quarters. We would like to get it clarified. We think general plan policies related to neighborhood integrity and protecting the character of our neighborhoods is important. We think we can have a development on our quarters and elsewhere in the city that is consistent with that. We don't think that's the current situation, but it isn't really being discussed now by anybody, including the commission and including the council. So we would like you to decide to talk about it uh, at some future meeting and then based on what you decide to do, hopefully get the council involved. So thank you very much, and it sounds like you might do that, and I hope that will be what you do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Rose, and I'm here on behalf of Common Roots Farm, formerly known as Costanoa Commons Farm. And uh, we've had, a, recently we had the name change, but our mission is still the same. Uh, we are an organic urban farm for people with and without disabilities, growing healthy food, beautiful flowers, and building community. Um, we have taken out a long-term lease um, because we feel that our mission is very compatible with our landlord. We just entered our second year of farming production, vegetables, fruit, flowers, um, and a wheelchair accessible greenhouse with hydroponics. Um, we just hired our very first uh, disabled intern, Carson, and he takes care of our, uh, he comes weekly and he takes care of our chickens and crops and now learning how to work in the greenhouse. Um, we are also excited to welcome Santa Cruz City Schools workability students to teach them life and job skills. And then we just hired um, an inclusion specialist so that her job mainly is to work with people with um, disabilities, farmers and volunteers working with those without disabilities so that everyone can fully participate in our farm. So I'm saying all this because we really plan to be a long-term uh, valuable um, area for uh, the community. And so on behalf of our board of directors, I would like to ask um, that the city take the lead in an open and transparent process um, to develop the um, area plan for Golf Club Drive. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Philippe Habib, and I'm here on behalf of Coastal Haven Families. We're a group of parents of young adults with developmental disabilities, and our mission is to provide quality housing at an affordable rent for our children, as well as for other people from the greater Santa Cruz community. And as part of our desire to use our resources to benefit people with and without disabilities and the greater community, we are also supporting the nonprofit Common Roots Farm that Lisa just talked about. And uh, we'd like to see the continued use of the nearly 125 year history of farming and providing healthy food to Santa Cruz that the land has behind it. And uh, we have been able to secure entitlements for the construction portion of our project in spite of the fact that there hasn't been an area plan yet, but we would really like to see the area plan get worked on and we'd like to see the city take the lead in having that happen so that we as landowners can have uh, some understanding and certainty about what the future will be for us there. So we are requesting that the city 
take the lead on creating an area plan for the golf club drive area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's close item number three on the list. So item number three being, sorry. The housing element. I mean, I realize that we started some discussion on golf club drive and uh, the corridor studies, and there was some public comment on that. I don't think it's appropriate for us to continue deliberations on that, but we've noted the folks that came out tonight for items that were included. I would like to talk a little bit uh, more about the housing element, the a annual report itself. Sure. I have one question. I know at the county, the planning commission, the, this annual report is required by state law. At the county, the annual report goes to the county planning commission before it goes to the board of supervisors. And the commission has a chance to kind of weigh in and give, if they have any advice, I don't know if they ever, I don't follow the county planning commission very closely, so I don't know if they actually have advice, but it seems to me in, as, a, uh, as the group that's advising the council on plan issues, that it would make sense to run the annual report by the commission before the council gets it in order to be able to make comments to the, if we, if the commission has any, to make it comments to the commission, uh, to the council about the progress that's been made on the general plan. So I, I, I know you talk about it as going to the commission after the, after the council's already sent it off to the state and acted on it, but what would be the objection to having it come to the commission prior to it going to the council? Um, if, I, if I could address, uh, hi, I'm Catherine Donovan, senior planner with the Advanced Planning Division, and I actually write these reports. Um, these reports are required by the state. Um, the state requires that they be submitted to city council. City council doesn't have any input on them. We simply submit them. The county in, in their um, reporting process, they have actually incorporated into their uh, requirements that it go to the planning commission. It's, it is not required by state law and it's not a requirement that the, the city has, but it, the county for whatever reasons, um, did incorporate that requirement that it go first to the Planning Commission. Um, and we have, depending on how much time we have before we have to submit it to HCD, how long it takes me to get it done and when we can time it, sometimes we come to the Planning Commission first and sometimes we go to it afterwards. Um, since the only requirement is that we submit it to uh, Council if we're short on time, we do that and then come back, which is kind of what we did this year. And I'll add to, um, I, I don't think that there's any reason that we couldn't other than the timing. Um, again, the priorities, it, it sometimes things get moved. Additionally, this year, the reporting requirements were much more substantial than in previous years. And so Catherine worked on this until right up until the last minute possible to get it to council. Um, we usually try to get it to council a little sooner than that. But this year, I mean, it was just a lot more work. So again, it's not something that we, we couldn't do. I think it just depends on the reporting requirements if they change and, and other, scheduling, other scheduling items. So thank you, and I appreciate that. It seems a little ironic to me in a way that the uh, state imposes this requirement theoretically to have the localities annually look at their general plan and see how they're doing. And so it seems to me it provides an opportunity for the city through the planning commission and the council to sort of take a look at, okay, how are we doing with the general plan? And we get a lot of the state requirement focuses on the housing, but there are a lot of other elements of the general plan that also could, and the city does, I think, in the, in the plan, it talks about the other things that the city is doing that are related to carrying out the general plan policies. I think that's what's really um, worthwhile in terms of having these annual reports. I just think that it would really, if I understand that you can be under the gun and it's not possible to do it beforehand, but I think it does, uh, it, it does help the commission and does help the council to 
get that kind of annual review. And to the extent that that's an opportunity for the commission to talk about whether it's, you know, what we're doing on housing or what's happening with various projects or what other uh, parts of the general plan we should be emphasizing, it seems to me that's the intent of the state law to have the jurisdictions look at that. So I, I hear that um, you're not opposed to it. It's all, all the timing. I would hope that we could recommend that, if at all possible, that the commission receive the annual report first. I wanted to talk about the uh, what's happening with our RENA numbers? How, is that the, mm -hmm. the correct way to deal with the acronym? Um, I have the, uh, I guess, the, the PowerPoint slides that were presented to the city. Let me just say I was a little um, concerned, annoyed by one statement in the um, report itself where it talks about the inclusionary ordinance on page two of the general plan annual progress report where it says these changes in the ordinance uh, were aimed at maximizing the percentage of affordable units in a project while recognizing market, market e economics in the downtown versus elsewhere in the city. Because from my pers perspective, that gets close to double speak those changes reduce the amount of affordable housing that the city is requiring uh, by going from 15% to 10% outside of the downtown and by allowing this um, hardship exemption or reduction in affordability requirements which were you know the which were really the change the substantial changes in the ordinance it really doesn't seem to me to be a good argument to say that the city was maximizing the percentage of affordable units. I know the, the logic is, well, we got to re respond to the market economics, but I think that's debatable whether reducing the inclusionary requirement or allowing for it to potentially be eliminated is really a great way to uh, maximize affordable housing. So I'll, I wanted to point out on the development pipeline, table A2, that we're, oh, wait a minute, that's not the right one, because um, that doesn't say, uh, table one, where it talks about meeting 7% of the very low uh, percentage of um, affordable units that uh, were the arena targets, low 75%, moderate, 142% and above moderate, uh, 108%. We're meeting our moderate income and we're meeting our um, of moderate percentage. And in fact, once you get into what's in the pipeline, it's mostly above moderate. I mean, that's where it is. And I would also, uh, one question I wanted to ask had to do with the determination about ADUs where it's uh, the re one, somewhere along here it talks about how uh, ADUs used to be considered low, I think, but based on what some survey that was done, the new ones are considered uh, moderate, I think. Well, I guess my question is, why just the new ones? Um, is it is there any evidence that the existing ones? haven't also seen their rents rise. Um, mm. How do we know that actually all the uh, accessory dwelling units haven't really become moderate income because like other rental units, they reflect the market. So I just was wondering the, the basis for that determination. Um, this is something that we discussed with HCD when we originally um, well, I shouldn't say when we originally, I came on, this process has been going on for many years, and I've been doing it since um, 2000, well, I watched somebody else do it in 2013, did it with somebody looking over my shoulder in 2014 and took over in 2015. Um, and when I first started, our, our um, ADUs actually counted as low. Um, when I took over in 2015, we did another survey and determined that we really couldn't justify calling them low anymore and so we called them moderate and then this year we did another survey we i actually do a survey each year and 
and um, this year I couldn't justify calling them moderate anymore. And so now they're gonna be of moderate. Now we discussed this with HCD because it seems, um, your your point seems totally logical that if if the new ones are not not moderate or uh, that they're above moderate, then the old other ones are too. And they said you don't have to go back and change your numbers. That was that was the gist of it. That you can do this by the informal survey. That is an appropriate method, and you don't have to go back later and change the numbers. Um, that said, we, when I do the survey, it's not that 100% of those units that I surveyed came in at a price that was above moderate, but it was something like 85%, and this of course is a point in time. I'm not surveying every day for a year. Um, so there, there definitely are ADUs in the city that are probably still being rented at low rates and, and at moderate rates, but um, I don't feel that we can justify calling them that going forward unless next year prices suddenly drop, which I'm not anticipating. So is your survey of only of the new ADUs or is your survey of all the ADUs? It's, it's a, um, it, what I do is I go online and I look at all the rental databases and I look at what ADUs are renting for at that point in time. And it usually takes me a few days to, you know, I pull up the data and what I can find and I usually find, you know, between 15 and 20 different ADUs. And this year, there was one of them that was a real outlier that was below a thousand dollars, and the rest of them were between two thousand and thirty-five hundred, which is so. So you're really looking, high. you're doing a survey of those ADUs that are for rent that are on the market rent. at the moment, and they could yeah. be new ones or they could be old exactly, ones. Exactly. Yeah. So essentially, the state has let the city off the hook of really, um, in terms of determining where the the various category targets are being met. Yeah, this new report, you're not familiar with the reports that we've done in the past, but this this year the housing element report is vastly expanded. And that that one table, the table A2, um, one of the thing, one of the categories that they ask for in there is whether the affordability has a deed restriction or other covenant that is, right. and 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 you have a choice of saying yes or no. I mean, there's two columns. One is yes, and the other is no. This is the first time that's happened, but to me that reflects the fact that they recognize that um, this is a legitimate thing that communities are doing. This is a statewide um, report, and what happens in Santa Cruz is not going to be the same as what happens in you know, Bakersfield or, or um, I'm trying to think Capitola. of some other place. Capitola. <laughs> I don't know, Capitola is probably pretty similar. <laughs> um, so I think in some communities, uh, they're gonna have very, very different results. But um, for us, we struggle to come anywhere near those numbers. And if, I, if, we, can, if we can come to those numbers in a way that the state mm -hmm recognizes as justified, I'm going to do it. I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm sorry to take time on sort of the trying to understand the, the basis. I mean, the real concern from table one is that we need a lot more affordable housing. Um, and when you look also with A2 in terms of what's in the pipeline, there are seven low, very low income, 69. I, I, I'm, I don't know which project that is. It's probably some project, uh, one of the Ocean Street projects or Water Street Water projects. Street. Um, but then there are 40, 440 above moderate income units that are in the pipeline. I agree that the city <coughs> needs housing, but the city really needs more affordable housing. And that takes me to what I'm going to ask next, is that we look again, or we ask to look again, I know we can tonight, but 
at what the inclusionary ordinance requires in, to in terms of affordable units. I think 15% um, is low, but I think it's the most that can reasonably be required. But I think it should be required throughout the city, whether it's a rental project or it's an ownership project. And I think it's important that developers know that they need to provide that inclusionary housing. Because if the city allows ways like this showing hardship as a way of avoiding the 15% requirement, every developer is going to be able to show hardship. Because just like paying the traffic impact fees or meeting the energy efficiency standards, it costs money. And it's, it's, I think affordable housing is an important enough public policy that it needs to be considered a cost of doing business for you know, uh, multifamily developers in the city. So I, I don't know if the commission uh, will be willing to agendize the inclusionary ordinance so we can talk about those. Uh, I know the council is considering uh, initiating changes to the, the ordinance along these lines, but I think it's really critical that we do that uh, in order to try to uh, increase the number of affordable. May I make a clarifying point as well, just very quickly? Um, so just so the planning commissioners are aware, in May, the council will be working on a six-month goal-setting policy. Uh, that will kind of direct our work for the next six months. And then um, they are working on a larger three-year plan. So this, I think, is relevant both to this topic as well as the topic that we spoke about uh, previously in terms of the uh, prioritization of work. So do know that that is coming as well. Thank you. Julie? Yeah, I'd like to make two points. Um, and uh, the first one is, um, I mean, we'll take direction from the council. They, they will send it to us and we'll discuss it when it comes to us and I look forward to that. Um, my concern when I look at these numbers, the RENA numbers, um, and it, it may be obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway, um, our greatest deficit by far and away are the very low and the low income categories. Those are not categories of housing that are produced through inclusionary construction or inclusionary zoning. Those are the um, units that we know can only be built with a significant public investment. Um, I'm, of course, deeply concerned about those, those also. And um, I know that the city is anticipating um, a couple of big things. One of them is having the, um, the RDA bond money freed up and having it available to make those public investments, um, which is just tremendously important. And I understand, I was in Sacramento this week, um, that we are anticipating that soon. So that's one thing. And the other thing that is important to point out that, um, of course, our inclusionary zoning is incredibly important. But one of the very important tools that we have in order to deeply target affordable housing is through strategies such as land donation. Um, that it is, um, you know, on occasion, and we've had a recent example, um, where it is very clearly of greater benefit to um, the city and to furthering affordable housing to get a land donation that enables a significant development that deeply targets affordability. Um, and I think that, that the combination of those two strategies are going to, I think, allow the city to actually, I'm hoping, address the very low and low income categories. Um, so looking forward to that piece, but I think that deficit is worth pointing out. Thank you. Any other? Okay, Andy. Two things. One, my concern is meeting a 15% requirement. It doesn't have to be within the project. So I don't have an objection to land donations. Mm -hmm. I think they need to be tied to projects that are actually going to happen within somebody's foreseeable future rather than something that's <coughs> pie, pie in the sky. I've been at the county. There was a uh, out in Aptos, the county uh, allowed uh, a, a land donation, and it's 30 years later. Don't get me started. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. The other thing is... Um, there is the potential of having what are called project-based vouchers. And those are Section 8 vouchers that can be tied 
to a market rate project. Up to 25% of the units in a market rate project can have project-based vouchers. And those are Section 8 vouchers which allow for very low-income people to be able to live in the units. Most of them are they go with people and they go out and they try to find a, play, a landlord to, to rent to them. But the Housing Authority has the ability to uh, attach them to a project. So from that perspective, it is possible through an inclusionary, uh, mar mostly market rate project, to include some housing for low income, uh, low income families. But I think in addition, there is a great need for what I think of as workforce housing, for housing for people who aren't uh, don't have low enough incomes that they can qualify for these subsidized programs. But the need is great. And so um, their only chance now of, of, of having units that they can afford is through the inclusionary requirement. And that's why I think that's maybe not the very low. It's more low, maybe low moderate. But it's, it's working families who are not able to afford even ADUs anymore. If ADUs are in the above moderate category, that's pretty scary because the whole point of ADUs was creating a supply of lower rent uh, housing for people. And so that's, uh, it, uh, it's, a, it's a disturbing trend, I think, um, because it sort of undercuts the whole logic of essentially converting single family neighbor neighborhoods into two family neighborhoods by allowing second units on every lot. Um, so anyway, I think, uh, I hope that the commission soon will be talking about this and will be open to um, supporting some changes that would um, strengthen the commitment to uh, a 15% inclusionary requirement. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, well, I appreciate this conversation greatly, and I, you know, I was also. Um, I mean, I've seen these numbers before, but it's very concerning. Uh, when you when you see the extremely low and low numbers, and when you also consider the the fact that even the moderate are shifting into the um, above moderate category, and reinforcing the idea that we just kind of need a, an all hands on deck approach that is multi dimensional and that includes at least fifteen percent inclusionary, it seems to me, um, as well as you know these other kinds of strategies. From and I'm thinking about you know, strategies that are being adopted in the Bay Area now, like a public land for housing kind of strategy, like, you know, that cities are, are really starting to look at their public lands that are available and coming up with a, um, you know, a, a strategy for, uh, for making those, uh, of giving priority to affordable housing in as much as possible for all of those lands. So I, I appreciate that comment as well, um, San Francisco and Oakland being two leaders in that effort. But... Um, you know, I think we should keep in mind also that in the same way that we talk about environmental impact reports um, or em environmental impacts for and negative effects of, of particular developments, that when we have this excessive amount of above moderate development, it also has effects. So it's not just that we're behind in developing affordable housing. By developing so much unaffordable housing, it's having all kinds of effects on the market as we'll see with the, with the, you know, the rental task force. So it's, you know, there are equity effects, there are economic effects of having market that's completely kind of suffused with luxury, you know, market rate luxury housing that's pushing out people to a point that it's very hard to dial back if we don't act soon. I, I'd just like to clarify that um, generally we just list things as above moderate if they have no, uh, if we have no method for ensuring that they are not above moderate. It doesn't necessarily mean that each and every one of those units is going to be an above moderate unit. It, it simply means that it doesn't have an affordability requirement. The ADUs are a little bit of a special case because as, as um, Commissioner Schifrin said, um, we we originally uh, opened that opened our zoning up to allow ADUs B 
because the state required us to, and also because we were um, <coughs> anticipating that those smaller units would be affordable. But, um, you know, n not every unit that is listed as an above moderate unit is necessarily going to actually be above moderate. Um, that said, the housing prices in Santa Cruz are just nuts, and we all know that. Yeah. And that's what I'm kind of going on here, yeah. is that whatever is getting built is getting built. It's competing with what's been being built, and, and so it's this kind of arms race of increasing, increasing numbers. And so, you know, whatever we can do to turn that around, I think, and not assume there's going to be some kind of, you know, filtering effect or trickle down of housing that's being built at this high level, that we just need more housing to be built and that's gonna affect, you know, affordability down the road in 20, 30, 40 years. By that point, all the low income people will no longer be able to afford to live here or moderate income people as well. And the rest will. Yeah. So. Any other commissioners? Well, I think, I mean, just to your, to, to, to what you just brought up, I, I think, I think that, I mean, I think there is part of that, um, that, Housing needs to be built. I mean, just more units do need to be built, and it's. Um, I wouldn't. I, I don't necessarily think that it. We have to. Um, I, mean, I think it, it's a discussion we'll, we'll have eventually if that comes to us about uh, fifteen percent inclusionary. Um, I mean, it was a. It's a discussion we've 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 had in the past, um, and we arrived at, at the numbers that were arrived at, and. Um, but, but I do think that, um, you know, we are in a housing crisis and it, it just, you know, part of it is needing to buy, build more units entirely. And that's, and so I do believe that that's, that's part of it. And, um, so, I mean, I don't know what the, um, in terms of this, in terms of table, um, one, like if exactly where we, you know, if, where we rank against other communities um, within this, um, but, you know, or, or even what historically we, what it's been over the past, you know, however many years to, to be able to look at that in, you know, to compare year to year or against other communities. But, um, you know, but I think, well, I mean, I think we all know that, you know, we're in a housing crisis, and I think it's you know it's throughout California entirely, um, and so it's just a matter of you know, is it um, you know the corridor you know corridor came up. I mean you know, in terms of being able to um, build more units, you know we have discussed uh, needing to build in density, and um, and you know the corridor you know, plan was, was, uh, you know, a thought for that. And, you know, maybe that's going to be something we'll, we'll be, um, discussing in the near future as well. Um, but that's, you know, seems to me, you know, more units if, and if it can happen on the corridor, if that is what happens and, you know, we can get inclusionary to be 15%, maybe that's a, maybe that's a win-win all around. And, you know, but, you know, those are discussions we'll have to have. Thank you. Robert? Since we're throwing out uh, policies generally related to the RENA numbers and the report back period and the imbalance towards affordable housing versus the above market rate or moderate above housing numbers, um, if we're just throwing out discussions that are related to that, I'd love to discuss, bring back to this commission, the potential of of drastically increasing the density bonus allowable on city limits, uh, much in the same way the county has done to stimulate uh, affordable housing development. Density bonus, unlike an inclusionary, which is simply just, you know, you got to discount 15% of whatever inventory you're making to be restricted to affordability incomes, doesn't provide any money or subsidy to help achieve that, and thus the other units have to be offset that cost. Um, Density bonus says you can actually go above and beyond what the local zoning requires if you go even deeper on affordability. So it's all about 
drastically creating the economic incentives to increase the number of affordable units. And you can even tier it so that you can go, you get more density bonus if you go deeply low income or low income. And so you can create a policy that's based upon the economic incentives based upon the fundamental tool that local governments have, which is our zoning, right? And so uh, I think it's a much more effective policy, both numerically in terms of generating more affordable units of all income levels based upon reading numbers. And we can look at case studies in San Diego or other deeply urban areas where this has been effective. But I think overall, we've talked about the inclusionary ordinance as this commission through an entire exhaustive two-year process. And we arrived at the numbers we did. I believe they were approved unanimously by this commission and by about uh, a, a significant majority of the council when they were first adopted. So, you know, as much as I would love to revisit inclusionary, I think there are other policies that have been demonstrably better at reaching the same policy outcomes with less capital stake from the city's perspective that we have more control over that are more relevant to the discussion about the imbalance of the different reading numbers that we're seeing in this report. So I'd love if we're gonna go ahead and just revisit topics related to those numbers, if we could bring back some other ones as well that are being revisited by jurisdictions right in our own backyard. Thank you for that. So state law requires the city to have a density bonus ordinance. And so although the state law is unbelievably confusing to understand from my perspective, the city already has a density, uh, density bonus provisions. Um, and is acting consistent with state law. So it's not like density bonus doesn't exist. I'm certainly happy to talk about, talk more about it. Um, what I'm getting the sense is that since the council is talking about these issues, the inclusionary levels, the inclusionary ordinance, um, rather than just initiating it on our own, or asking to initiate it on our own, we should wait to see what the council does. But I would like to uh, make a motion that we ask staff to return as soon as possible, f f to agendize as soon as possible, a discussion of uh, the corridor plan and the uh, Golf Club Drive area plan. Yes, we have uh, a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second that. We have a second. And let me say that uh, in terms of the corridor plan, kind of responding to your concern about uh, your, the points that you made about density and uh, along the corridor is that the corridor plan was adopted in the general plan and there was a lot of opposition when projects started to come through. The zoning ordinance has never been amended to be consistent with the general plan policies, right? The council essentially decided that they were not gonna go forward with that. So we have a situation now where there's an inconsistency between the general plan and the zoning ordinance. And I think that inconsistency makes it difficult for anybody to come forward with a project because you're likely to be, unless you can somehow come up with a project that's consistent with both, which doesn't meet what the-, the I wanna make a point here. Yeah, I think we're diving too deep into this, this topic, unfortunately. Um, we do have a motion on the floor to bring this to an agendized topic for discussion, and we have a second. Could we have a, a roll call? I would like to jump in. Yeah, go ahead. You want to? <laughs> um, so I, uh, w w we have in a couple different ways. Um, we've made it clear that we're interested in seeing this. I don't think it's our role to um, create the agenda um, for this commission. It's not my understanding of our role. Um, we take direction from the council. And we've already made a couple of recommendations. So we certainly can make, um, there's nothing wrong with doing an agenda, but I just, I'll, I'll be voting against it. Council asked that it be put on our agenda. All I'm asking is that it be put on our agenda. So I think it's doing exactly what the council okay. asked for. It's that it didn't happen. Um, and so I don't think there's anything inappropriate in making a motion to ask staff to agendize it. I think that's, I, I, um, it's really, again, I mean, I, I think it's a matter of degree. Andy, I, I, um, it is going to be reviewed. It is going to be looked at. And I know how complex it is to be juggling, um, you know, staff loads, what they're, t what they're doing. They are work working on that. There is a plan to take that through the council already. And I mean, certainly there's nothing wrong with doing it. I'm just letting you know that I, I feel like that's um, duly noted already. So I'll be voting against it. 
Christian. Uh, did, so, um, I guess maybe I want to put some clarification. Did council ask that it be agendized on our agenda? So um, when we were giving the presentation on the housing element report and general plan report that you have before you, um, Council Member Brown made the motion that we bring this to the commission, which we were planning to do and which is here today, and that also we bring you uh, the golf club drive area, uh, golf club drive policies and the corridor policies from the uh, general plan for your review. We did ask a number of questions in terms of what type of review. Um, she just wants, the, the motion was that the, the commission looks at it, but there was no timing tied with that. And so again, given the competing priorities that we have and other direction that we've received from council in terms of prioritization, which has pushed the corridors process back, that is in the queue and it will come as soon as we are able to bring it. it um, and then the other question about priorities, um, uh, the priorities that you currently have were ones that were directed recently by council. Absolutely. Our priorities changed substantially when the new council came on. Um, since the beginning of the year, the focus has been very strongly on um, tenant protections, uh, landlord protections, and homelessness. And so all of the things that we had in the queue from the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee previously for the beginning of this year have now been pushed back in the queue so that we can use our resources to address those topics and come back to council. We've been at council almost every meeting um, with a new report related to those things. So without additional resources, it's, it, again, I, I hate to say it, but it is in the queue to come as soon as we have the capacity to bring it forward. But that's the that's the priority you've been given, and they've continued to, yes. to to stick with that priority. Okay. Yeah. So my take on that is I'm kind of satisfied with that answer. I think we're going to get it fairly soon. I don't know if that means two months or four months. You know, maybe six months. I'm not sure, but uh, it sounds like the council is um, trying to make their way and figure out priorities. And I think if it rises to the top, we're going to get it in the, you know, two month scenario versus six. So I, I'm not in support of putting another item on to, to agendize that. I think it's, you know, we can have this discussion at the next meeting if, if we feel it's still not being addressed and, and not going forward. I don't think we need to push the issue. That's, that's my opinion. If I could say, we're not going to discuss it if it's not on the agenda. So all the motion says is put it on the agenda so we can discuss it. If there's not support to do that, what that says to me, if the council wants us to talk about some, uh, something, they better say exactly when they want us to talk about it because they gave a direction for this to come to the, to the commission as part of their direction on the general plan annual report. Staff decided independently that that wasn't what the council meant. What the council meant is whenever they got around to it, given their cue, they would bring it to the commission. So what if the commission isn't, from my perspective, willing to ask that the council, you know, the council uh, priorities be talked about or account, the, the council direction be followed, then the council better be very, con <laughs> very concrete when they want something to be looked at by the commission because Staff will interpret it any way that they want, and I don't think that that's what the if the, if if that if the if the staff was interpreting the council direction to mean that they bring they bring these things to the commission when it, 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 they came up in the queue, they should have said that. Um, the council passed the motion saying bring the the general plan to the commission with the uh, with the corridor study with the uh, golf club drive policies and I think their assumption would be they'd come together as a little package um, not that staff would determine well yeah we're ready to go on the, the general plan annual report but we'll get around to the the other things that the council asked the commission to talk about when when we when we have the time and you know the idea that we're acting in response to the council we're looking to the council to give direction i think they gave direction and all i'm asking is that we follow that direction talk about what they 
have asked us to talk about. If I may make a clarifying point, um, I appreciate your passion and I completely believe that these are important topics, but I do want to clarify that uh, the motion did not indicate that they needed to come at the same time. And so um, staff, again, based on workload considerations and urgency of other items, decided we did not, we knew that the larger project was going to need to wait because of the resources, but we did not want this report to wait. So we could have waited and brought them both at a separate time to three months in the future, um, but we, we thought it would be prudent to go ahead and act on as much of the motion as we could, which is why we brought this now, and we will continue to work on the other item. But again, there was no indication in the motion that they needed to come at the same time. I'd, I'd like to call a question, if possible. Sure. Like to do what? I'd like to call the question to vote, to vote on oh. the motion. Can I just quickly say, I just wanted to add that I think it's significant that the things that the council is also prioritizing um, include tenant protections um, and homelessness and things that are really kind of the immediate result of this housing crisis that are kind of like the most urgent things with people being, you know, pushed out, with people living on the streets and so forth. Um, and so it makes sense that there would be a sense that we need to prioritize those most urgent issues. I think one of the things that arose with the debate around rent control so much last, you know, last year was the issue of, well, these ordinances are not going to solve the question of production of new affordable housing. And so, you know, how we think about production, preservation, protection kind of together um, become something for us to figure out. I think prioritizing protection and preservation in the short term makes sense. It seems to me that, you know, the corridors plan and so forth is something that we need to have in mind in order to conceive of density and, and production in any kind of meaningful sense. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there. I understand this issue of kind of timing of things given the, the state of the crisis that we're in. Um, at the same time that I really hope that given the, the nature of the debate in this town, that we can get to talking about these things together. Thank you. So I would like to just clarify what the motion is that we're going to vote on, and then I'd like to call this vote. The motion is to just agendize the next meeting, if possible, the corridor study and corridor policies and the uh, off Club Drive area. Uh, policy. Okay. We have our second. So could we please take a, a roll call vote? Commissioner Schifrin? Aye. Conway? No. Spellman? Aye. Hepping? Uh, Nielsen? No. Greenberg? Aye. Singleton? No. Guess what? This comes back on our next agenda. Just like you wanted. <laughs> there you go. All right, we have another item on our agenda this evening, another order of business, and it's a recommendation that we formally adopt the Planning Commission meeting guidelines to guide meeting proceedings. Hmm, interesting. Good evening, Commissioners. Good evening. Sarah DeLeon, Principal Analyst for the Planning Department. It's my first presentation with you guys and gals, um, and I'm excited about it for that reason, it being the first one and also just the topic of our conversation tonight, which is preserving the integrity of the public process, which it looks like most, if not all of you, have read the staff report, which is awesome. So I will attempt to be brief and then bring it to you. If you have any questions, I'll do my very best to answer them. Um, but essentially, the report I provided covered three basic areas, when public can comment, when you can take action, and attending outside meetings, for more importantly, when there's a quorum present. Um, the public comment one is the easiest one to answer. The answer is yes. The public may comment on any item on the agenda. It doesn't matter the section, the heading section, informational or otherwise. Um, just make sure that it happens before taking action is the best thing. And we also have to remember the section about oral communications for things not on the agenda. The public should comment on those items in that section as well. Um, the second major category regarding taking action uh, the crux of the issue was about informational items, um, and that's why we kind of went back and brought you guys that informal 
guideline. We called it the welcome on uh, your planning commission page. The Historic Preservation Commission also has it. That's the document we're recommending that you adopt tonight, which did state in there that the informational items typically don't have action taken on them, um, but nowhere else in the Brown Act does it specify any sections. Um, besides the part that discusses our 72-hour notice, and the important part being that the public has an idea of what you're going to be deliberating on and action to be taken. So it's the description of that agenda item that needs to be very specific. Typically, for our informational items, we don't list out what we're going to be discussing because inherently it's just been like an update of that kind. Um, so the hope in that section is if you are to agendize something that you intend to take action on, outside of public hearings, that should go under general business. Keeps us safe from not describing properly what's to be discussed. Uh, the last item in general was the outside meeting question. And this, the spirit of the law really here is, again, that you guys, when you're coming to agreement and taking an action that you're doing it publicly and openly and that you're not with each other, they call it the daisy chain if you read one of the attachments about serial communications. You're not telling each other what your stance is outside of the meetings. And it can also happen among members of the public who could inform you of other meetings that they've had with you and saying your position on such things. So it's really just about public trust being as fragile as it is, perception, and keeping yourself in that safe area where no one can really attempt to say that serial communications has been violated. So. I will leave it with that broad overview of the report. And if you guys have any questions or otherwise, I'm here. Thank you. Do any commissioners have questions? I do. The staff report indicates that um, the, the laws that govern it, the, the meeting mm -hmm. are the Brown Act, the council handbook and the bylaws. My understanding is that the council handbook and the bylaws are not laws. If we violate um, the policy in the council handbook or our, our, uh, our bylaws, I'm not sure what the consequence is of doing that. It's we're in violation of, you know, the council maybe could kick us off the planning commission, but. Um, you violate the Brown Act, you've you got serious problems. Uh, there are financial implications, there are criminal implications. Yeah, it, it could be a real problem. Um, so I think it's important to sort of clarify that there is a difference between those two kinds of um, directions. And that, you know, there, it's not to say that the council handbook isn't important or that the guidelines, um, that the bylaws aren't important. <coughs> or if the commission <coughs> adopts meeting guidelines that they're not worth um, following. But that doesn't mean that we're going to be violating the law if a commission at some meeting decides, well, we don't really want to do it this way. We'll do it a different way. So What's the consequence? Maybe that's my question. What's the consequence? Well, it's no consequence for me. But yeah, well, what's the consequence <laughs> for me if right. I do something in violation of the council handbook? Or yeah, what the I'm saying, I don't, I don't, it's not me who holds anyone accountable here, but it is the bylaws are the law, or excuse me, the Brown Act is the law. The bylaws and council handbook is, is there for a reason and guides, essentially. Now, the right. consequences of that, the bylaws do state and are there for a reason, I would say, from just past experiences, rules are typically created because something maybe negative happened that we want to avoid in the future. Um, so even though they are seen more as guidelines to the process that they still add on, much like you know our, our charter can't be any less strict than uh, the state law, can, we can be more strict, which is essentially how these guidelines act in that sense. So. It's council policy, it's their direction, it's the handbook they adopted. Um, the bylaws reference the council book, the council book references state law, so. I'm not saying they shouldn't be taken seriously, yeah. but I just want to clear that we're not violating the law if the bylaws get violated or the council policies. That it's a different level of importance, it seems to me. It's not that handbook or bylaws aren't important, that there won't be any consequences it's not illegal in the 
I would leave that to the attorney, but probably side on the side that the Brown Act is the one that there would be official consequences for. Okay, then I had um, a little concern with the, this, what can be talked about during information items, and I brought okay. this up before. The Brown Act always says the agenda has to say what you're going to discuss. Right. It doesn't say that you have to say what you're going to do. And that's kind of what the policy is, is indicating, that um, the, the agenda should say what the proposed action is. I think if we know what it is, mm -hmm. there are a couple of problems with that that I see. What if the commission wants to do something that isn't what the proposed action is? Right. Or what if it's an information item and people really get all hot and bothered about it and they want to take action on it? They're allowed under the Brown Act to do that. As long as the item doesn't have to be more than 20 words, says what's being talked about. So if tonight we had wanted to take an action on the general plan annual report and send it back to the council and say, this is wrong or that's wrong or the other thing is wrong. We could have taken action on that, even though the agenda says you're gonna, we're going to review the information. That would not be a violation of the Brown Act. And I think we have the, we have the legal ability to do that. And I don't, I'm not supportive of guidelines that would act like we don't. Because we don't get to set the agenda. Staff sets the agenda, maybe with consultation with the, uh, with the chair, but commission members don't get to set the agenda. So if to, we're going to be bound to only be able to do what you put on the agenda saying what we're going to do, that's much too restrictive and it's not legal. Uh, it's not legally required as far as I'm concerned. So I'm, I would like to go through our, I have a few concerns with the language uh, that's in the meeting guidelines. I think generally it's good. I think generally the staff report is good. Uh, I appreciate having it. I think it's helpful to have these, but I, I think they're a little too restrictive in a couple of parts. So at least I have some suggestions um, for clarifying them. Before you guys jump in any further, I would like to say that I do respectfully disagree with what you're adding. And it's not necessarily the bylaws that are restrictive in the sense of description and what you're saying. And I think your guys' last item is a perfect example of that. You were given a, the, a line item on the agenda says an annual update about X, Y, and Z. Yet we were diving into policy conversations, which rightfully the chair had said we're going to agendize that for the future. You had some discussion in, about what that conversation would hope to be, and you did that openly. And so now we will agendize that, given that all of you here today have what you hope to discuss, and it'll be placed on an agenda. And agreed about the recommendation. We don't want to call everybody and say, hey, what do you think your action is going to be? That would be a problem. Um, but we can more specifically, less than 20 words. It does not have to be exact to the action you're taking, but more describe, you know, we're going to discuss the corridor policy and the golf, golf drive area plan, whatever it might be. So the public can really say, I do want to go to that. Because if it just says general plan and housing element and not 335 golf area plan, that could trigger different interests from the public. So that's the Brown Act, being specific as to making sure what is to be discussed and taken action on is clear. Okay, well, I guess I wasn't clear. I'm sorry. Um, because I'm not saying I think it's totally appropriate. We couldn't talk about the corridor study. We couldn't really get into, we could ask that it come back so we could talk about the <laughs> golf club drive thing. But we could take action on the 2018 general plan and housing element annual progress report. <laughs> that was on the agenda. We could have said we have some real concerns with that. Um, we think there's misinformation in the report. We would recommend that there be changes in the, the report. Mm -hmm. We could recommend that the council not, um, you know, that the council reconsider some of it. Hold we on. could take action on that Correct. general plan, even mm -hmm. though it says recommendation review information. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because Correct. it does, it, it does uh, identify what's being discussed. It does tell the public if they care about the general plan annual report, they can come and hear us yabber about it, and they can yabber about it, and then we may or may not do anything. We right. may just, so that's the only clarification that I want to make, because you're absolutely right. 
we can't under that decide that we're going to make a recommendation on what to do about the golf club drive area plan. That's inappropriate and not legal. Okay, so that's, those are, um, I don't know if it's okay with the uh, chair if I go through some of these concerns that I have. Sure. Um, the, uh, again, when the. Which document uh, are you looking at? I'm looking at the planning commission meeting guidelines. I think it was attachment five. I believe so. Uh, yes. Yep, attachment five. Everybody have one or? Okay. Where it talks about um, under oral communications, it says if you wish to speak to the planning commission about an item not on the agenda, you should do so under oral communications. My understanding is it should be an item that's, you know, legitimately before the, that the commission, you know, it's not talking about what, how much money the parks department should get. Um, and so I would say, but within, I would say if, if we wish to speak to the planning commission about an item not on the agenda, but within the purview of the commission, you should do it during oral communication. So to make clear that it's not a free for all for anything anybody might want to talk about. One suggestion. The other one on page two, it says speakers may sign up, assign the sheet uh, near the speaker stand so that their name may be accurately recorded in the minutes. I don't think that should be under oral communications. I think that should be just under the paragraph that talks about what the procedures are because it apply. It doesn't just apply to oral communications. It applies to everything. So I think we should put that there. Um, those are the ones that are non-controversial. <laughs> now to move into ones that may be a little bit more, where it says at the bottom of the page, a maximum of 15 minutes total may be set aside for members of the public. That's going to vary so much. I mean, there was more than 15 minutes of public presentation today on the, you know, the public hearing. I just think a maximum total time may be set for the members of the public so that the chair has the ability to say, okay, we're going to, you know, there are 150 people here. We're only going to talk about allow public testimony for an hour or 42 minutes. Everybody has a minute. I think that's legitimate, but have an arbitrary time of 15 minutes. It isn't realistic, and I don't think it's, uh, it's really justified given the kinds of differences. So I would recommend that we... Uh, that we change that. Um, then under order of general business, when it talks about public comment, it says three minutes. Well, I would say generally three minutes, but even tonight, you know, you allow the, you, the chair allow people two minutes, and that's the prerogative of the chair. So I think rather than put it in our guidelines that everybody's guaranteed three minutes, that I think that's generally the case. So I think that would be a... Uh, a, clar a clarification. And then order, order of public hearings. And tonight was a good example of the concern that I have. Um, the staff made a presentation. If it was a private developer, the private development, the applicant would make a presentation. Well, there might be groups that have concerns. So there should be the ability of the chair to what I would say the language I came up with is organized groups in support or with concerns may be granted additional time up to 20 minutes by the presiding officer. So to essentially allow to happen what happened tonight. We'll know that that's the case, that groups can come as they all, you know, as they do, and they say, we know three minutes isn't enough, we want more. I think that's a legitimate thing to ask for. Um, I would add it under public comment, where it says, again, three minutes. Again, I would say uh, of public hearings that that's generally three minutes, because again, if there are a lot of people, it could be more than three minutes. Um, and the last change I have is under information items. Um, staff has said typically no action that may be taken, um, and that's fine. May uh, however, advisory body members may request the information items be placed on a future ad agenda for discussion and action or take action by a majority vote because we have the right to take action by a majority vote. Jim wants to. So I think 
the, the guideline should reflect that. So those are all suggested changes I would make in, uh, uh, in the meeting guidelines. Thank you. I have a comment. I have a comment. Yeah. yeah. Julie? I think those are good. Um, I really agree with them, except with one exception, and that is the um, the chair um, does have the ability to grant an aggregation of time, um, and I don't. I mean that that's there. Where does it say that? It always. I mean that's actually one of what was what my question was going to be. That has been our custom as long as I've been on this commission, and it is up to the chair. Um, I mean, as you did tonight, you granted um, the Sierra Club an additional time at the beginning. And um, I th I would prefer, and, and codifying it would be all right with me, but I, it's that was too specific. And I really didn't like the sort of the assumption that it could go up to 20 minutes. Um, you know, but so an indication th that um, it's up to the chair. Because as far as I know, it, it may only be by custom. But it's gone on as long as I've been here. Well, I'm willing to take out the 20 minutes. I just thought organized. So I think the have as much as the applicant. But it, no, I don't think is I don't think that they necessarily should be able to have as much as the applicant. I mean, they may be that makes sense, but it may very well not make sense, and it could make the meeting very clunky and awkward. Yeah. And I think the purpose of this would be to um, indicate that they have the right to request it, and the chair has the right to grant it. Well, that's what I tried to say, that mm -hmm. organized groups in support are with concern may be granted additional time. I said up to 20 minutes, I'm not sure about that, mm -hmm. by the presiding officer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that would, uh, would codify what mm -hmm. the, uh, it, the commission does things, which I think is the purpose I of think having it is this. Too. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. And I think, so this evening it was, the fact that the Sierra Club wanted extra mm -hmm. time was done ahead of time. And I think we also want to be able to address things that don't happen ahead of time. If there's a group that wants to make a statement, they don't know about communicating in advance to gain extra time to talk. Um, I don't, yeah, I think we should collectively try and understand what the timing is and the duration. Uh, I don't think we want to make it right. a, a substantially long amount. So. I was prepared tonight to give the Sierra Club essentially double the time of another person. I I didn't really have to go there because I asked the, the person speaking how much time they thought they needed, and it was within that time frame, and that was, good. That was it. If, if they would have asked for substantially more, I probably would have said, this is what I'm willing to give at this time. And it would have been a little bit less than, than 20. I think 20 would have been long. Probably 10 minutes would be sufficient. And I, I think that's my point, is that we want the chair to be able to run an orderly meeting. Um, and so, I mean, I really like your clarifications. I think that they're helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do. And I think uh, you, you're going to get a sense from attendance, how many speakers. It could be appropriate, you know. <laughs> To give more if there's just a few people and there's a few people engaged in that issue and they want to have time to, to make that case. So I think there's certainly flexibility there. If we're writing down how we want to run meetings, it should, you know, it should sort of accurately reflect what our, what the procedure that we want. So yeah. my suggestions were only ways to kind sure. of clarify based on my understanding of how the commission okay. <coughs> does it. Like, Do we have other commissioners who want to chime in on this? Okay. So I would make a motion that the commission approve the guidelines. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Let's uh, <laughs> let's open it up then for public comment, please. Gillian Green said, um, uh, in, in terms of just to, it's really just asking for clarification uh, about groups and how much time groups will have. The City Council's practice is you have to um, contact them ahead of time, and that's why I asked Mike to contact the chair, because I didn't have uh, Chair Pepping's email. 
to get extra, some extra time. So am I hearing it correctly that you're saying that that's not necessary at the Planning Commission as long as people... So um, it, it, it sounds to me it might be a little bit... Com um, what's the word? Um, not confusing, but maybe make the process a little bit difficult if people <laughs> who are here want extra time and they say oh, I'm with you know yeah. the sure. beach area group and uh, I want extra time when they come up to speak so maybe some process to make it clearer and more orderly so that's just one point and the other point is I really the 15 minute I, I just was agreeing with um, Commissioner um, Schifrin about 15 minutes was too short for public comments so adjust it with the people the numbers of people here but okay. the more time the better from this side of the podium thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. go ahead yeah i really appreciate that thank you for that comment and i i, I read that 15 minute limit as sort of more of an indication than an actual limit like it like the the chair can limit it but so i i'm really glad we're making the clarification I also think it's a good point, and I've certainly seen meetings get derailed and downright awkward when we have a completely packed room and people start swapping time and it, you know, it looks a little bit like a cattle sale. And um, I like the idea of being very explicit that if people want to aggregate time as a group, that um, they make that request prior to the meeting. And then they'll know that they need to, or, and it doesn't necessarily be by email long ahead, but um, that they at least need to make a plan for that. I like that idea. I think it would make meetings go better. Mm -hmm. If I could, Chair, Tess might give me very angry eyes if I didn't mention the heartache we had a minute ago about the video maybe or maybe not working. So we do appreciate the advance notice, much like the city clerk gets, so we can set up properly for media. Just FYI. Yeah, I'm concerned okay. about the message. I think we do need to communicate very clearly on what the process should be. Uh, you know, it's harder, I think, for people to understand that and in advance make a request for more time. I think... Uh, allowing the groups and the congregation, you're probably going to get less time in my thinking about this, right? If you're just going to show up at the meeting and you're a group and you want more time, my tendency is you're not going to get the same amount of time as if you spoke through the channels, got some extra time, and, and are able to make your K. I mean, I, that's just my thought. I thought about this idea of should it be beforehand, should it be close, should it be <laughs> meeting, and so what I came up with in the end was vagueness, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like, mm -hmm. you have to, it's up to the presiding officer. You put in a sentence that doing it in advance is better, um, maybe we could ask the staff if, we, if we're going to do this, this, I don't know the language that the council uses. Now, the council has had lots more people coming to it, lots more problems um, in terms of maintaining you know, the order of the meeting. So I think they, it makes sense for them to have fairly strict requirements because it could get pretty wild. I don't have a sense that that's been a problem here. It certainly wasn't a problem tonight. Maybe it has been before my time. We've had very packed rooms. No, I know very packed, but in terms of, you know, and it doesn't matter whether there's an organized group or not. Somebody's going to get up and say, I want to give so-and-so minutes. And that's going to be, you, that's a decision that the chair can make. At your own time. We allow organized groups to do it. You, you know, you want to get up and say so. I agree that that's not very in terms, I mean, I would like our, I would like to have meeting guidelines that really reflect. Yeah, that we can uh, point to. What we, what yeah, no, I think those are all great comments. And <clears throat> so I would prefer, I guess, at this point, to just sort of keep it more general. That if you're an organized group, you get the chair to give you time. You can do it at the meeting. You can do it before the meeting. You can request it, and it's at the discretion of the chair. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I agree with that. Going to try to determine when you can. Dis uh, so I would move that we approve the um, 
meeting guidelines. I don't know whether I need to go over all those changes again or whether you got them. I got them here. I can go and Yes, well, has my back. So I, I would yes. move that. Um, Approve the meeting guidelines with the changes as recommended, and that maybe we get uh, as a consent agenda item next time the fi a final copy just to make sure that it ends up the way we want. Because I went through a lot of stuff, and I'm happy to if you have questions to respond. So that's my motion. Perfect. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a second. Any more discussion? Do we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Schifrin. Aye. Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Pepping? Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Singleton? Aye. Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. And do we have any informational items this evening? Uh, I do have a couple of items for um, just note. Uh, so the first is at the upcoming council meeting on the 23rd. Uh, in the evening session, the planning department will be doing our budget update. And so we will be talking about kind of some of the things that we have done in this last year, our accomplishments and our expectations in terms of what we think our work plan will be for the next year. Um, of course, council sets that, but we do have some stuff that's still in the pipeline. So we'll be presenting that. So uh, if you're interested in attending or watching, please do. Uh, I think we may be the only item on the agenda. The agenda is posted today. So you may want to confirm that. But I, I do know we're at the 7 p.m. session. Uh, the other item I wanted to let you know um, is that I'm proud to tell you that staff was invited, the city was invited to present at the 2019 National American Planning Association Conference in San Francisco. That happened this last weekend. Uh, several of us went, um, myself, Lee, uh, Tina from the city manager's office and former mayor Cynthia Chase, and we gave a presentation on the Housing Voices Outreach Policy, our ho homeless coordinating co um, committee uh, work that was done in 2017 in the housing blueprint process. And it was really well received. People were really excited and we were really happy to be able to present that on the national stage. So anyway, just wanted to let you guys know about that and um, that we're going to keep promoting that work. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank oh, you. Congratulations. So any subcommittee advisory body oral reports? I don't believe so. I don't have anything on my radar. I, the technical advisory committee for Project, I think it's going to be Thank you. All right, seeing no other reports, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great.